Shazza's spell is weakening as we speak! Hasten then! We must get to the Dwarven Gate before the others! This way! Come now, just a little farther. The portal to Dominia is right over there. Oh, listen. Minotaur. Ugh, another tension duel. It's all this excitement, you know. Remember, the only way to enter Dominia is by strength of will. Of course, a little magic never hurt. The gate. We must find the gate. Look, it's opening. Holy writ, the spell of protection is broken at last. Ah, so this is Coskin Keep. Den of villainy and home of goblins, ruled over by Aaron the Relentless. And this must be Unhava Township, whose fiery folk love a good debate, especially when accompanied by a good brew at the inn. In the plains is Asen Abbey, the bureaucratic and cultural center of the region, but currently, I hear, showing signs of spiritual decay. And on the floating isle, the infamous wizard school, bastion of imperial knowledge, founded by Faraz to teach the basics of magic. Before you now are the spectral bears, guardians of the caravans which cross the great wood. Goblins may flee from them, but others hold them in high regard. And this is the carapace, a type of living armor for it will take its life to save yours. An enchanting card, in my opinion. Ah, yes. Aaron the Relentless, an intriguing, if not twisted, character. The self-appointed Goblin King, an immortal who's been assassinated some 27 times by his loyal subjects. <laughs> A curious individual now. Veldrain of Sengir, who's been called a necromantic puppet, meaning a mere tool of Baron Sengir. Does carry a nice dwarven made sword, however. And alas, the Baron himself, Baron Sengir, ruler of the land from the Koskin Mountains to the edge of the sea. An ancient and powerful vampire, but not an evil guy, really. He just knows what he wants and won't stop till he gets it. As you'll discover, there's much more to this new world of homelands. A world of intrigue and magic. Not to mention, surprises. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Resleavables Homelands Edition. I'm your host, Cedric Phillips, at Cedric A. Phillips on all the things. And I am, as usual, joined by my co-host, Patrick Sullivan, at Basic Mountain on Twitter. Patrick, it's me and it's green. And what's inside of these are, uh, I don't have a rhyme. They're not good. Um... Yeah, I don't have it. I don't have it. Anyway, it looks great. Great it does, packaging it art. It does look good. One compliment I do have for Homelands is that the packaging, the art, all the sort of aesthetics of it is excellent, I think. And this booster wrapper, in my opinion, is a big step forward. Now, unfortunately, the individual cards in the set are something of a step back. Why is that, we'll a, into. Why is that a big But deal? if you were just looking through a store, looking for a pack of magic, yeah, this would catch your eye. You know, this will draw your attention yeah. or your mom's attention yes. or your dad's attention who are like, hey, what can I get the kids uh, at home? So they stop screaming for hopefully an hour. Well, funny you should mention that. 
because at this point, I had been playing Magic for about a year. Okay. First project I ever got was a two-player starter deck uh, of Revised. Yep. When I was, I think, 15, 14. Not exactly sure. Okay. Seventh grade. So okay. I recall it beginning to play. And so at this point, I was in. Fast forward a year. Christmas approaching the following year. I'd argue you're still in. Still in. But I am loving it. Okay. My younger brother also plays. Not as enthusiastically, but he has some decks and we play a fair bit. So we're at an age now where parents don't have to make an effort to conceal the Christmas presents. Yep. They can just get the tree up and then slowly wrap and sort of deploy leading up to the day of. Okay. So we go to the tree. We're shaking around presents, trying to hear, you know, figure out what's going on. Big shakes is like the best part of Christmas. And inside of the tree or on the tree inside of the branches. Okay. There are two wrapped packages that are very slender. One for me and one for my younger brother. And we conclude that the only thing that could possibly be in there is an eight card pack of magic. Okay. Following up on last year's theme, because they got us this game kind of speculatively. And now we're both really into it. Okay. So we're looking at this and we're thinking, could be a pack of Arabian Nights. Could be a pack of Antiquities. Even the dark would be sweet. It wasn't like we opened a bunch of packs of the dark. Could be. Surely it wouldn't be Fallen Empires. No. Who would do that? Well, my, my dad's got a certain sense for when someone's trying to sort of give him the hard sell. Okay. So the image of him walking into a retail store and the owner being like, they're going to want Fallen Empires. He would have sniffed that out for sure. Oh, that's good. That's so good. Christmas morning comes. First thing I do, I bolt. Want to get open up that pack. Okay. Open it up and inside is a pack of homelands. My brother's is exactly the same. And we sort of look at each other and turn and we go, thanks, mom and dad. This is really thoughtful. It's so cool. Love this. Even though we know for sure there's nothing. My younger brother quit magic permanently. Not that much after longer after this, unfortunately. After this old baby? Yeah. Can you imagine? He messaged me. My brother, who is a, you know, hasn't played magic in about, you know, 25 years, I guess, at this point. Okay. He messaged me and he's like, oh, yeah, I've been watching the receivables. It's really sweet. Can't wait for Homelands because that's when I quit. <laughs> and now here we are. <laughs> well, we have finally gotten here, Patrick's brother. So we hope you're enjoying this episode. We hope everybody else is prepared to enjoy this episode. More importantly, we hope you're in. You're ready to enjoy us starting things off as we always do with the facts of Homelands. All right, everybody, welcome to the facts of Homeland, as we always do to kick off these episodes of the Resleevables. But before we get to the facts of this fantastic set of magic, we got to get to the facts of Tales of Adventure. Tales of Adventure is both a physical store in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania, and also an online retailer. In addition to that, they're at basically every single event in the United States. Their website is toamagic.com. And also make sure you're following Michael Caffrey on Twitter at TOA Michael. He posts sales and deals throughout the week. So you're going to want to make sure that you're checking that out regularly. They have every single card for Homelands in inventory right now. Additionally, their high-end stuff all comes with individual scans. So you can be confident in the condition and price of the card that you're purchasing. Make sure to use promo code RESLEEVABLES at checkout for 8% off of any order. And remember that any order placed inside the United States comes with free shipping and tracking. Tales of Adventure, Eternal lives here. All righty. Now we do begin with the fun stuff. Homelands is the seventh Magic the Gathering expansion and second set in the Ice Age block until July 2006 when it was removed and Cold Snap was added to the block. So in July of 2006, Cold Snap in, Homelands out. So I understand that this is under the category of facts. Yes. And I understand that what you're saying is technically true. Yes. I completely reject this telling of history. Okay. This is made up. Homelands is still part of the block. The end. Noted. Yeah. I know that 
you know, this is not actual truth, but your your truth. <laughs> Speak your yeah. truth. Yeah, we need a second section, a subsection in here called alternate facts. Okay. Which is basically me pushing back on the reality I don't want to live in. You're the person who edits the Wikipedia page. Yes. Yeah, you're just like, you know what, this isn't true. No. It does not it is still part of ICH block, although you are technically correct. It was removed when Cold Snap was brought in. Uh, Homelands is frequently panned as Magic's all-time low in game design, though it has been praised for the quality of its setting and flavor. Uh, we're going to talk about those things over the course of this episode because I actually agree with that little factoid um, that the game design aspect of this set is horrible, uh, but the setting and flavor is awesome. I don't even know if I would call the game design horrible. I would describe it as absent. Okay. Part of the problem with Homelands is there's essentially nothing new going on. There are a handful of individual designs that I could point to as being pretty cool, a step in the right direction, proof of concept, whatever you want to call it. But what really dings the set is there's nothing new to latch on to. Arguably, this was also the case in Fallen Empires. Arguably, this is also the case in the dark. But this combined with an extremely low power level made it feel like there was really nothing added by this set. Uh, Homelands was developed as a separate expansion from the current Ice Age block at the time. Uh, if you've ever gone through the Homeland set list, you'll notice that there's really nothing tying it to Ice Age whatsoever with regards to mechanics or art or setting or flavor. Uh, so it was very clearly a separate thing altogether. Uh, it introduced no new mechanics or keywords, but used some of the mechanics of Ice Age, most notably the cantrip ability and single color legendary creatures. But if you're looking for something like Commune of Upkeep or Snow, you won't find it here. I think there are maybe one or two enchant worlds that's piggybacking a little bit off of what happened in Legends. As you mentioned, the monocolor legend is an extension of what occurred in Ice Age. No. But to, you know, to circle back, we're talking really sparse in terms of anything new or even capturing uh, and having an update for something old. Uh, each color had at least one legend, with some colors having as many as five. And then the absence of mechanics found throughout the Ice Age block, such as the aforementioned snow mechanic and cumulative upkeep, and the fact that it didn't follow the Ice Age block storyline, make it a poor fit in its former block, even though Patrick does not recognize that. Right. Got it. Uh, Homeland contains 115 black bordered cards. There are 25 commons, 47 uncommons, and 43 rares. Uh, it was printed on 121 card sheets, 46 commons, uh, 25 at C4 and 21 at C1, and 69 uncommons, 26 at U3, and 43 at U1. And to note, U1 are considered the rares of the set. Because of the number of uncommons to commons in a pack, C1 and U3 cards are of equal rarity despite being printed on different sheets and are considered the uncommons of the set. And each of the C4 commons has two versions of art by the same artist. Most collectors consider these variants to be distinct cards and therefore a full set to be 140 cards. But you are the final arbiter on this. Do you consider it to be 140 cards? I don't. Okay. But I do like this this the move in this direction okay magic at this point has experimented a handful of times with having multiple arts of the same card yep. it was all over the place in fallen empires there was a little bit going on in antiquities as well something that was brought up was well four pieces of art is really confusing to see the same card over and over again but with different art makes it harder to sort of quickly digest what's happening inside of a game i don't know if i necessarily agree with that but to me, two is the sweet spot. That gives you the option to pick your favorite one without inundating the player base as a whole with all these different arts that they need to kind of keep up with. Okay. So two is it. Two it is. Two is fine. If you're going to do it, I think two is the right number. Okay. Uh, if these art variants are treated as distinct, there are 71 commons in Homelands, 50 at C2 and 21 at C1. And it is worth noting that this is the last expansion to be printed on two card sheets and sold in eight card booster packs. Two cards from the uncommon sheet and six cards from the common sheet are in the boosters. Each booster has the same green background image as we highlighted at the beginning of the episode. And it was different from recent boosters with card art on it like we saw in Ice Age with that Yeti. That lacks a yeti maybe it's a piece, piece of the of the this is no, no no it's not no that's not not that's not not still not happy about that not not photoed 
Yeah. The Yeti, yes. <laughs> the name of the card or the point of the card. Uh, and then, of course, the last thing to note here is the Homelands lands have a unique teal colored text box. We have seen over the first handful of sets of Magic's history that the lands actually have kind of a different color text box a couple of times around. And you find that here in Homelands as well. Let's talk about the release date of Homelands, October 14th, 1995. It was the first Magic set with a simultaneous international release in English, German, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Italian. There were release events involved with this set's release as well. I don't think you attended these or really remember these all these well, unfortunately. I don't, but I believe that one of them occurred in New York City. That is correct. and. I have heard some of the people in my inner circle who are even older than I am, believe it or not, who are around for this. Okay. Particularly Brian David Marshall. He was I, around for everything. I think there is a chance that he was, in fact, the tournament organizer for this, or at least uh, competed. I'm going to see if I can get him on the on the, on the the horn here and uh, tell me if he's got any stories or was there or any physical memorabilia from the event. That would be awesome. I think that he is our best bet for someone who could actually speak to this event. The pro tour historian, but I like to just call him magic historian. Yeah. I think it's more accurate. Um, so of course, nowadays we see all sorts of set releases, early access events on magic arena and pre-releases that take place in big places or at your local game store and all these things. Right. So we're used to it now as a magic audience. So back then that wasn't a thing until now magic, the gathering one, uh, Never heard of it, but I did some research on it, and it was a special celebration for Magic held on October 14th, 1995 in New York City, as you mentioned, at a Broadway hotel. The event featured quite a few things. A passage or portal that allowed visitors to actually experience Dominaria, the mystical worlds in which Magic is set. Visitors encountered many sights, sounds, and textures along the path. Now remember, this is in 1995. In 2023, when we're recording this, you can make an immersive experience. You could do a little VR headset, maybe something AI related. Who knows? Oh, are you telling me that someone in a paper mache minotaur helmet and wielding a paper mache mace is not immersive for you? Use your imagination. You sound like my father. He yeah. would absolutely say, use I your get that a lot from you. Yeah. Use your imagination. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is exactly what he would say. Uh, my dad loves like the old Batman, like yeah. the old TV show with Adam West. He's of like, course. we don't need any special effects. Yeah. Well, I have that an imagination. Show does have special effects. Yeah. But he's like, I have an imagination. I don't need anything special. It, it says pow. When true. That, yeah. There's plenty that. of special effects. And then you can turn it, you could say pow in your own head, however you think it should be said. Right. If anything, I think that the pow is like too much. I'm really hoping we can get a pow on the screen now. I'm sure we can. That would be great. Uh, let's see what else we got here. A 3D visual environment called Virtual I.O. that introduced visitors to some Homelands cards. Okay. Uh, the opportunity to play Magic with Richard Garfield. That's sweet. I bet the line was long. Probably. How do you even do that? Like raffle? If there's just a line. Yeah. That's that, tough. Yeah. There's just a line. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the appearance of artists, both Magic and otherwise. So if you have gone to a Magic Con this year or have been to Grand Prix or heck, any Magic event really over the past decade, you see Magic artists with their booths and they've got prints and all this other stuff. But this started way back when. Uh, some artists that were there include Christopher Rush, Anson Maddox, I know a favorite of yours, and Pete Venters, among many. Uh, we also had the preview of new and future Magic products by Wizards of the Coast licensing, licensing partners. There's three of them. There was Acclaim Comics, whose Armada division was the publisher of several Magic the Gathering related comics. Now, we got these comics. Yeah. But we don't have any Magic ones, do we? No, I think Acclaim, this is this is me trying to pull this out of my memory. So okay. if I'm completely off, I'm completely off. Let us know in the YouTube comments. But my recollection is that Acclaim had the rights to Mortal Kombat. Okay. And started making some Mortal Kombat related comic books. Okay. And sort of piggyback that into other licenses, okay. basically licensed comic books uh, at the time. I don't believe I ever owned any of the claim Magic Comic books. I also might be completely making this up. Sure. This is my recollection from about 30 years ago, but they were sort of in this hybrid. We wanted to do. Uh, have a comic book division, but under the umbrella of licensed fantasy and 
uh, other sorts of properties. Okay. Uh, here's one thing we know we're not making up. Micropro Software, a computer software company that made Chandelar arguably the best video game of all time. Okay, I'm going to cut that arguably out of it. It okay. is the greatest video game of all time. It weirdly holds up. And if you are someone who can either ignore or appreciate the uh, very archaic graphics and other elements of the game, if you love magic, give it a shot. This is, I, I, I do, I am half joking, but this is a phenomenal game if you like magic and sort of open world uh, role-playing games. All right, here's the thing I'm going to say that I don't know if it's true or not, but I am, uh, I'm going to assume that it is true. So I, I imagine if I went onto like any wizard's webpage, there's no place to download Chandelar. I'd be shocked. But there should be. You can download Magic Arena. You can download Magic Online. And if you want to kick it old school, you can download Chandelar and just play that. Well, I think... What's the, wrong with that? I think part of the problem would be that you have Arena and Magic Online, okay, which are projects with tens and maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in them. Okay. That, you know, provide a lot of revenue for Wizards of the Coast in various ways. Yep. And it's like, oh, how about this game that came out? Uh, 10 years before Magic Online, and it's better, and it's free to play. Oh, yeah, it's bad news. Yeah. yeah, It's too fun to give people access to. What if, okay, hang with me, just thought of this now. Okay. Okay, so we can't do that. Okay. Can we make it a mobile game? Chandelier? Yeah, can we bring it to mobile? I don't see why not. Figure out some way to get some microtransactions? Just let people No, that off. would, yeah. Well, I look, if we're gonna, if we have to give something, we can't just say put Chandelier as a mobile game. They can't make any money. It would ruin the it. experience if I was wandering around Chandelier on my phone, having the time of my life, and then suddenly Sarah Angel popped up and said, do you want to spend $2 for a month? Yeah, how about just some sleeves? <laughs> how about just some sleeves? Oh, sleeves? Some aesthetics. Okay, okay. You can just buy the cards. Okay, fine. We'll yeah. talk, we can talk about it. All right. You know, we got to be, it's a light touch for that sort of thing. We're idea people. Uh, Harper Collins, the last one to note here, a publishing company that published 12 books related to magic. Uh, this line was discontinued once Watsy started publishing its own books. Uh, and a little wrinkle that came out of this was, if you're familiar with the card, Mana Crypt, a commander staple. Oh, yeah. You told, you told me about this. Printed several times. You might be familiar with one, uh, the original Mana Crypt, which is called the book promo. And if you're wondering how that it got that name or how you acquired it, it was because you mailed in like a UPC and one of the receipts from one of the books. They sent you a Mana Crypt. Okay. Cool. I mean, that is pretty rad. This was before my time, so I didn't, I didn't have an opportunity to get a Mana Crypt. But when someone explained it to me, that was the first time I felt like I got it in the game too late. Okay, so I will say, if you Google Mana Crypt UPC promo, there are things that do show up. So that's it. Oh, here we go. Harper Prism book inserts. Oh, was it inside the book? I My recollection I was there's a, a UPC you had to manage. I'd have to dig a little bit deeper. It wasn't just like in the book somewhere. Sure, sure. These books, boy, they're old. Because if it was just in the book somewhere, there would have been a rash oh, of- Oh, here we go. Yeah. How's this look? That look familiar? That I mean, that, that is proof of what I was talking about. Okay. Uh, I, I've never seen that before, but that looks right. So uh, we're probably going to have an image on the screen front for you that says free unique card offer. Uh, promo cards that were available, it looks like. I didn't, I didn't know this. Arena, Giant Badger- Mana Crypt, Sewers of Estark, Wind Seeker Centaur. Oh, so it's all of them. So all of those cards are rancid, except for Mana Crypt, which is one of the 50 or 100 most powerful cards ever made. This is a fun webpage that I literally <laughs> just found during the show that I'm going to keep for my editor, uh, John, to maybe pull some stuff and bring it up for you guys on the screen. That's actually pretty cool. You want a Mana Crypt or a giant badger? badger. Think, think carefully. Badger. Yeah. Uh, one deals damage to them and one deals damage to me. How's this close? Badger. There was also, uh, by the way, uh, two Homeland release events. So if you actually wanted to play with the cards, you could do this too at Magic the Gathering 1. Uh, there was also two other release events that did uh, take place that involved Homelands. There was International Spiel Tag, uh, which is better known as Essen Spiel, is uh, at the Essen Game Fair in Essen, Germany. Uh, I have been to that uh, twice in 2018 and 2019. Uh, Patrick, you've never been. I've avoided going to it several times. That is a really good way to put it, <laughs> is avoiding it. Not because it's not fun. It's actually it's really fun. Gigantic. It is way bigger than you can possibly wrap your head around. So most of you who are watching this are eh, likely to be American and have been to Gen Con before. Gen Con is a very big show uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. It basically takes over that city for 
four to five days. The best four days in gaming, I believe it's called. Yeah, that's, and that's that's a really good catchphrase. Yeah. And kind of hard to argue. Now, if we look at attendance numbers for that show, Gen Con, uh, I'm just going to look at this past year here in lovely 2023, where they had, it looks like a, a rough estimate of 70,000 folks in attendance. Uh, if you look at Gen Con 2017, there was 50,000 folks in attendance. Uh, so, you know, somewhere around your 50, 60, 70,000 people attended unofficial count. Uh, if you look at Essence Spiel, 2017 had 182,000 people. Uh, 2022, which was last year, had 147,000 people. And 2023's session spiel has not happened yet. It'll be happening soon here. Uh, this thing is massive. It's in a very, very, very large convention center uh, with, if memory serves, some ex- not just concrete floors, extremely concrete floors, mm-hmm. uh, which means if you don't have the right shoes and who would ever do such a thing. Hi, everyone. I'm Cedric Phillips here at the Ultimate Guard booth at Spiel in Essen, Germany. <gasps> Your feet might end up hurting. Midway through day one and all of day two mm-hmm. and all of day three and every other day that you're there. Uh, there's a ton. Um, wow. Oh, my gosh. I'm reading a line here with 1,021 exhibitors from 50 nations in 2016. Spiel is the biggest fair for board games in the world. That's so many exhibitors. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. People love their board games. <laughs> they like having a lot of little pieces. They like having a map. Maps are cool. If you've been to a Magic Con this year, there's like, I'm going to just rough guess, say like 20 exhibitors. Mm-hmm. 20, which it's a lot to choose from. I would guess it's a little bit more than that if you're talking about the vendors as well. I am. But if you're, I would guess it's, but like a lot of them are just kind of small booths where someone just has their own Yeah, I mean, retail you, you were in Minneapolis. Yeah, 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 sure. But 1,021, uh-huh. that is an outrageous number. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, suffice to say, Essen is very, very large, and they had some uh, Homeland stuff going on there. And then there was the Luca Comics Convention in Luca, Italy, which uh, we've never been to, uh, but it's similarly a large uh, comics convention. A couple other final facts here, folks. These ones are the important ones. Uh, Homeland's expansion symbols a simplified globe of Ogrotha, the plane where Homeland's was set. This set was designed by Kyle Namvar and Scott Scooter Hungerford. You might be wondering who those two people are with good reason. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, The set was developed by Charlie Cantini, Scaff Elias, Jim Lynn, Joel Mick, and Dave Petty. Now, if you've watched any episodes of this show previously, first of all, thank you. Second of all, that the nickname for that group is the East Coast Playtesters, which you've learned over the past handful of episodes and have heard those names a lot because they were very influential individuals at the beginning stages of magic. Uh, Kyle and Scott, not so much. Homelands, on average, had an unexpectedly low power level compared to previous released expansions. The expansion was created, as many of the earlier sets were, without much communication between designers of various sets. We've talked about this before. Uh, this is in 1995. It's not, it's not in 2023. We don't have Slack channels. We don't have Discord. We don't have any of those things. And it was made with a flavor-first design philosophy, which, along with its separate storyline, resulted in its strong difference from Ice Age and Alliances. Remember, Ice Age, Alliances, they're actually part of the ice age block I, according to patrick this set is as well uh though this set has again virtually nothing to do with snow community of upkeep and flavor and setting has very little to do with what's going on in ice age as well uh this flavor first design also led to oddities and abilities like having flying in green and vigilance and trample in black final note and the most important of the bunch R&D at the time garfield and the aforementioned east coast playtesters didn't want to print the set But Peter Atkinson overruled them because he wanted to keep his promise to the two designers, Kyle and Scott. As a result, the developers didn't put much work into Homelands. And it shows. Yeah, I think there. uh, some of it's the low power level. But again, some of it is just there's not anything to think about. No, there's a middle ground. I would argue in between doing nothing and then and doing a ton of work, which would be. What if we took a mana off of Autumn Willow, Ishan Shade, and a handful of other, you know, cool big creatures or storyline characters or whatever? So some of the problem is that the top of the range in this set, the most powerful cards, are not good enough. Sure. That's something that you can improve on very easily. Yep. There's a second problem, which is the nuts and bolts cards are so obviously overcosted and boring yep. that you're thumbing through your pack 
and there's nothing to look at, nothing to think about. So even if you didn't want to put in a full development cycle, if you gave me this file for 15 minutes, <laughs> sure, I would sure. be able to make some pretty significant improvements. Sure. So it's telling that it didn't even get that far in terms of the development iteration. It's a tough pill to swallow um, in so far as it's crazy to me to even think about going into a meeting and just going like, we shouldn't print this set. Mm -hmm. Now, it's I'm not necessarily saying they're wrong. Because as things unfolded, the set's not very good. It's arguably one of Magic's worst sets ever. And the game was on a uh, notable de decline uh, at this stage of things. But just going in and being like, I don't want to do it. It's, it's just like, it's just kind of nuts. So you hit on a really relevant point here, which is this set is coming out on the heels of Fallen Empires, Ice Age, Chronicles, and 4th Edition. Yeah. Sets that are composed either largely of reprints or are noticeably weaker and less appealing than the sets that came out earlier. Yep. So if you're saying we shouldn't put this set out, it's not because Homelands is necessarily abstractly that much worse than any of the other sets we're talking about. Yep. It's we can't do five in a row like this. No, it's probably not a good idea. So if you're aware there's an issue, there's an alternative to the cancel it or do nothing, which well, what is would that be? do some work. <laughs> sure, sure. There's some fun. Uh, I don't know if you can get past the fact that there's just not much in the way of new cards, new mechanics, new stuff to latch on to. Yeah. You need a little bit more than what's going on here for a certain level of kind of momentum and excitement. But even if you're not willing to do that, you could just take five of the most appealing cards in the set, whatever, however you want to define that, and just take a man off of them. The end. We're done. You uh, Like I said, you give me 15 minutes with this set. Autumn Willow now costs green, green, three. Okay. Ishan Shade, black, 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 two. Okay. I could probably find, you know, a few few other cards. Can we make Memory Labs cost more? Yeah. Is memory right? Labs goes up. All right, thanks. May, maybe Merchant Scroll goes up. All right, great. But we could find a few other cards, I'm sure, that could comfortably have a mana or two taken off with no long-term concerns about development or balance. Okay. So I would offer that if you're aware that this is an issue such that you're advocating for not putting the set out, mm -hmm. maybe just do, maybe spend an afternoon on the development. Yeah. I don't, we're not I don't asking much. <laughs> I'm not asking much. I'm not saying that it doesn't need a whole, it doesn't need a whole month cycle. I'm not arguing that. Just spend a little time on it. It would have gone a long way. Uh, those are the facts for homelands now this is normally where i transition our show into the lore and the storyline and the vorthos of a set i normally don't have much for you but that is not the case this time around i will be telling you quite the tale about baron senior and friends right after this all right everybody it is now time for the flavor the storyline the lore the vorthos whatever you want to call it of homelands I've got it for you in spades this time around. Now, as I mentioned before, we got to this portion of the show. Normally, I don't have much for you, and that's because Magic didn't really focus on creating characters, lore, storyline, really all that much, mm -hmm. right? We had Mishra and Urza a little bit. We had the Dark, but that was kind of a look at the world of the Dark. Yeah, so we have Arabian Nights, which is derived from actual real world. That's a, yeah, that's a real thing. Antiquities, which is telling the story of the Brothers' War, yep, but not in a way where there's a start, middle, and conclusion. Okay, you get these little snippets and vignettes of individual things that have occurred, but not through the lens of telling an entire story. Yeah, you have legends, certainly a lot of world building and individual characters, but it just feels like a massive Dungeons and Dragons setting that you're sort of on the top of, looking down. And then you have the dark, which certainly has a tone and a certain energy to it, but there's no underlying story to the experience. Uh, Ice Age, we're starting to have something of a story. We're having starting to have something of a uh, big bad, but nothing compared to the uh, not only the depth of this, but the amount of borrowing from early magic storytelling, or even I, I don't even think it's fair to say storytelling, just some random flavor that was sprinkled in into alpha okay and using that 
as the foundation for building a world, which is its own entire setting. Well, it's story time with SETI P, everybody. I've got a lot to share with you. Uh, maybe you'll learn some fun things here about these characters, uh, or perhaps lack thereof. The Planeswalker Feroz, F-E-R-O-Z, came across Ugrotha, the once beautiful plane now destroyed by the Great War, which was also called also called the Wizards War. Now, what the heck is the Great War? Well, the Great War was the name given to the conflict between the Ancients, a group of powerful and jealous wizards and planeswalkers, and the Tolgath, an inquisitive group who were, quote, starving for knowledge, unquote. Uh, I'm going to guess that the Ancients were old, and Good. the Tolgath were not. Okay. Quite, yeah. the, quite the reach by me. Right. Okay. Uh, this this war, it raged for years and finally culminated on Ulgrotha with a battle known as the Great Destruction. The war ended when the young Tolgrath Ravi rang the apocalypse chime. That's a card in the set. That's going to be a reoccurring theme here, by the way. Without knowing its real effects. Well, it destroys all the cards. From... Yeah, yeah. It says it on the card. Ravi. Anyway. Uh, and created the Dead Zone killing almost every creature on the plane and destroying the mana lines of the world, leeching them off through the rifts the war had caused. So big, big, big destruction via the apocalypse chime. Only a small portion of the world remained inhabitable since it was fueled by a rift to another plane opened by the ancient wizard defeated by the same Ravi. Ten human generations later, the history of the Great War was almost forgotten since on Ogratha, there wasn't a single written language to record it. Only the dwarves seems to have understood that something terrible happened on the plane where they're trapped and are trying to put together the fragmented pieces of the history of the homelands. Now, if we just stopped right there, we're doing more than any other set really has. For sure. Right? Yeah, especially the sort of asymmetrical focus on a particular creature type that has been present in Magic before. Yes. This is a set about dwarves. Yep. Naturally would imply you would have some other... Uh, creature types show up more than others, but it does give a focus to the set, potentially, if you design that way. What he said. Continue. Okay, <laughs> yes. So now, things to remember. Dwarves, Ravi. Remember those two things as we keep going. And our friend Pharaohs. He's back for more. Pharaohs was a planeswalker that thought the use of summoned beings was immortal. It was horrible. Don't do that. Uh, he studied cultures across the multiverse and journey to Ogrotha where he befriended Anaba Minotaur Sandru. So Sandru is an Anaba Minotaur. S-A-N-D-R-U-U. Normally a card of Sandru would come up on the screen, but I got bad news for you guys at home. Sandru was a Minotaur planeswalker from Ogrotha. And there's some minor backstory about our friend Sandru, but since the comic depicting the war in which he was relevant in was never made, what happened to Sandru is a bit of a mystery. Uh, to the best of my knowledge and my findings, there's been no Sandrew card whatsoever in Magic's history, which is a shame because I think this wonderful game could use a little bit more Minotaur representation. People love Minotaurs. I agree. They're, so, they're really fun. I'm a big Minotaur fan. Normally, they don't get their own story beats. They're just sort of like this mass of, uh, of a creature type. Of two threes. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of two threes. And a little personality would go a long way, I feel like. You know what I think? Just I'm just throwing this out there. They're saving it. Maybe. They're saving it for who knows what set. I don't know. This particular character? No, just like this, the return of Minotaurs in a meaningful way. Wasn't there, Maybe even this character. I feel character. like there was a set that I played recently that had a lot of two, three Minotaur tokens. <sighs> In the last year or two? I mean, like, maybe I'm in Cat, but I can't say for sure. No, here's it was later I'm, than that. Here's what I'm saying. I'm just saying, Wizards of the Coast, if you're watching this, can we get like a Minotaur world where the Minotaur, I don't care if they're good guys or bad guys. Maybe they're both. Doesn't really matter to me. Let's fire it up. Let's get Sandrew in print as well. It's kind of a shame. Uh, good friend of Pharaoh's who also never got a card, but we'll get to that in a second too. Um, <laughs> Pharaoh's eventually met fellow planeswalker Sarah, never heard of her, whom he married. They spent their time working together to restore the plane. In doing so, with the goal of protecting it, Pharaoh's ban was created. Which, technically, that is a card. Yeah, it's like uh, Nether Void for creatures, but for six mana. Yeah, it's it's not good, but it is a card. Uh, they then went to your place on Hava Inn, mm -hmm. uh, which is a sorcery, not a land or enchantment. Which a little is weird. A little weird. Maybe could have. Hey, that's one of those things if we gave you the file for 15 minutes. 
Yeah, I would be like, like why is this in? <laughs> it feels like sorcery would be maybe the second to last card type for this I after think, instant. It'd be I think it'd be fun as a creature. Sure. Just this building that attacks you. I, I guess. mean they've done they've done the sort of Baba Yaga's hut trope before okay sure yeah it could be a magical in i don't know that's true that's true it could have tokens come out of it right like you know uh various adventurers and soldiers spilling out to go there's a lot of room yeah for what you want this to be promise you it does not have to be a sorcery i i would agree uh at this on hava inn pharaohs and sarah met baron seigneur and were invited to come to his home castle seigneur which that one is a land they got that one right it's a card as well. So this happened in the Anhava Inn. They met Baron Senior. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was just hanging out at the inn. Right. So like Faroz and Sarah are like at the end getting a drink. And Baron Sanger is like, hey, I noticed you from across the bar. I really like your vibe. Yeah. Do you want to just come back to my place? Oh, yeah. If you see anything suspicious, though, you're not allowed to say anything well, or do anything about we it. We don't want to talk about that. We're going to get to <laughs> potentially maybe, maybe some <laughs> suspicious activity from a uh, gigantic vampire. Uh, Baron and Faroz. Excuse me, Baron told Pharaohs and Sarah not to interfere with his plan, whatever that could be. Uh, and Pharaohs and Sarah ignored this warning and helped the Algrothian people defend themselves against Baron. So let the fun begin. Who the heck is Baron Seigneur? Well, there's a lot to learn about this old vampire. Baron Seigneur is a vampire lord ruling the dark barony of Algrotha from Castle Seigneur. He's the progenitor of the Seigneur vampires that can be found on multiple planes, including Irene. Uh, represented in the card Irene Seigneur from Homelands. That's a set we're covering. There's Arvad, represented in the card Arvad the Cursed from Dominaria. There's Kazarov, represented in the card Kazarov Seigneur Pureblood from Dominaria. And there's Varric, represented in the card Varric Warped Seigneur from Dominaria United Commander. And we can't forget that there's also just the OG Seigneur Vampire. Yes, and this is something that I love about the uh, storytelling of Homelands. Going back to Alpha, we talked about how there's all these cards like Sanger Vampire, Sarah Angel, Finalish Hero. None of these cards, Shino and Dryad, another example. There's no real payoff for any of these cards other than the flavor text of the card itself. Yep. Describing a little bit about the world or the social relationships of the creatures, whatever the case may be. I thought it was really brilliant in Alpha to call things things like Finalish Hero, Shino and Dryads, etc. Partially because, well, you're probably going to make a lot of heroes and a lot of dryads and a lot of vampires and a lot of angels. So you do want to start calling them different things. But also those words like Sengur and Sarah, they're just cool, descriptive words, whatever. Maybe it lets you write a little bit of flavor text with a, a bit of direction to it. But it implies that there are other worlds and characters and conflicts and relationships that if you want to, you can go back and make it its own thing sure and magic's done it all over the place so it's really taking that uh architecture from alpha and saying what if we took it's basically two cards out of that set sarah angel Sager vampire and just built an entire world out of it incredible yeah it's pretty pretty forward thinking stuff so let's learn a little bit more about uh our favorite vampire here now senior was the son of a small baron so he's not Baron Senior yet. Uh, the young Baron was described as having perfectly white teeth, hair of a healthy shade of brown flattened on his head and precisely combed, and eyes almost black. His father started dabbling with black magic, and to be provided with fresh corpses, summoned a swarm of plague rats, that's a card, to infest a village under his protection. The Baron intended to become an immortal, and he had begun the path towards vampirism, bringing with him his son. The Baron also made his son sleep in a coffin, much to the disgust of the latter. So it's good to practice. It's important to share your interests with your kids. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. You play baseball. I play baseball. Right. I, I want to sleep in the coffin. You need to sleep. In the yeah. Coffin. You start sleeping in a coffin. Now you can tell me how good or bad it is. And then I'll start sleeping in the coffin. Right. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Uh, realizing the evil intentions of his father and believing he could be a better ruler. He started visiting the graveyard of the nearby village during the night did young Baron Seigneur. Uh, here he met a little orphan whose parents had died of the plague. It's kind of sad. Sensing some magical potential in her, he taught her the song used by his father to control the plague rats, asking her to kill his dad 
it's dark, to free her village from the plague. Okay, well, that makes some sense. Baron Sinir couldn't kill his father, or he wouldn't inherit his barony. So after some convincing, the girl finally agreed, fine, I'll sing the song that controls the rats to kill your dad. The two entered the castle with a swarm of plague rats subjugated by the girl at her heels. When the girl ordered the rats to attack the baron, the baron, he's no dummy, uh, he sang the same song of control and repelled the rats. Confused by the battle of wills, Patrick, the rats attacked the only other prey in the room. The little one. The young baron sneer. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Because he doesn't know the song of the rats. When the rats slashed the boy's throat, the baron, his dad, shouted a spell that hit his now dead son. Sensing the right moment, the girl once again ordered the plague rats to devour the older baron. They complied, and when she opened a window to let the sunlight enter, she heard a scream behind her. The young baron was alive. The slash in his throat completely healed by his father's final spell. However, he was visibly hurt by the sunlight and receded to a dark corner of the room. Because a vampire now. Yeah, he's a vampire now. Yeah, that's what happened there. Uh, he complimented the magic of the girl and suspected she would become a planeswalker. The two realized they didn't know each other's name. The girl's name was Ravi from earlier, uh, while the boy had just become the new Baron Seigneur. So now dad's gone. Mm-hmm. I'm in charge. It's my house now. Yep. Okay. We also discover in this reading that uh, Baron is not Baron Singer's first name. But it is a title of nobility. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. Yeah, because yeah. b- people have the first name Baron. Yeah. So it's, I actually just assumed that it meant that that, that was just. I thought it was name. a name for a really long time. Right. No, it's a, a title of, nobi- of nobility. Yeah. So now here's what we know for sure. Dad's dead. Young dude's in charge now. So centuries later, Baron Seigneur, think of the card, uh, was summoned during a Planeswalker duel on Ogrotha when the Planeswalker uh, lost, he fled the plane, leaving the Baron stranded. Uh oh, he's stuck in Algrotha without any means to leave. Senior decided, I'm not going to try to get home. I'm just going to make this my home now. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, by this time, the vampire had become as ruthless as his father, like father, like son. He found refuge from the elements in the swamps and tried to dominate the locals. This didn't work as intended, though, since the Baron was forced to exterminate them instead. Uh, he settled, his, excuse me, he settled his eyes on a newly constructed dwarven castle. Castle Senior, and decided to make it his own. All right, so we're here now. Yep. So we have someone who uh, became a vampire, and in the process of becoming a vampire, inherited a bunch of land. Yeah. Found himself on a new plane. Yep. And just immediately got to more land grabbing. Yes. I can't imagine a thing like that would happen. To pretty realize. evil. Yeah. This is pretty evil. Uh, Seigneur began a new barony consisting of several small villages encircling a graveyard. Whenever a villager was buried, he, uh, Seigneur would promptly raise them as a zombie servant. Eventually, this self-sufficient system provided him with an army with which to assault the rest of Ulgrotha. He slaughtered the dwarven occupants of the Castle of Morning Light, raising them as undead. And when the remaining dwarves came to reclaim the castle, he repelled them with three different attacks to send a clear message to them he also kidnapped the daughter of the king again pretty mean now you know not only kidnapping land and buildings now he's taking daughters it also seems like wholly unnecessary if you're a vampire yeah well, why are you doing all these like tricks of political subterfuge when you can just wipe out entire just kill them all. <laughs> it's yeah it's a little strange uh, <laughs> he turned her into a vampire oh that actually is an explanation okay that's, okay okay that's reasonable charming her to love him like a father and renaming her irene senior card this definitively broke the dwarf's spirit they abandoned the castle vowing revenge but it was at this time that the dwarves decided to keep secret the existence of a planner portal in the dwarven city under the castle mm, the plot thickens However, the Baron quickly found the hidden stairs leading from his throne to the Dwarven Gate. The plot got less thick. Mm -hmm. Even though he knew little of true magic, the vampire knew that a planner gate was a dangerous thing because he's not a dummy. None of the minions he sent through the gate ever came back. Again, not a dummy. Send the bozos first. Mm -hmm. Then you go. Searching the underground city and torturing Dwarven prisoners proved useless in discovering what lay on the other side of the planner gate. So he decided that he would get through only prepared with an army. He would forge this army from the inhabitants of the homelands. Searching the rest of the plane, he reached far in the dead zone, which was created, of course, by the apocalypse chime, excuse me, where he discovered a crumbled spire and inside of it a sealed coffin. Well, what's in the coffin? From it, 
He freed an old crone, completely mad. The two didn't recognize each other, but this was his childhood friend, Ravi. They're back. In any case, the Baron quickly sensed the magical prowess of the woman, and he brought her to his castle, renaming her Grandmother Seigneur, Guard. She became his teacher of black magic, wisdom, and lost knowledge. So we're kind of coming full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Ravi's back, renamed, magic guard in the set. Cool. Irene Seigneur found, cap- captured into a magic guard. Okay, great. Still got to figure out what's going on with this portal, though. So sometimes later, the Baron started sending his vampires against the citizens of Asin, which is a town. His intention wasn't to conquer them, but instill fear in them and erode their morale. At one point, the Baron had his servants kidnap humans from Asin, as well as a vessel carrying 31 families. He had them set up small villages in the swamp of his dark barony where they lived under his influence. Even if he didn't need the short-lived humans for any purpose, dominating them kept him entertained through the long years. Yeah, it's really, uh, it, it, that is sort of a through line in a lot of the storytelling. You know, like, all right, there's a, there's a planet portal, right? Yeah. You send your minions there, they don't, they don't come back. Yep. So it seems very likely that this is very mysterious, right? Because you yourself would not go in there. You don't know what's going on. Yep. And the minions you send in there are uh, not coming back. Yep. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just torture these dwarves and see if they got any information. Even yep. though it's like seems very obvious, no one would know anything. Because how would you? No one's ever come back. Sure. It was sure. just a passion project. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of that going on here. Where a lot of this is just overly convoluted, unnecessary but when you're immortal, you just got to get some hobbies. And sure. Here we are. Sure. There's no magic to play. Yeah, there's like not. That, yeah, so. yeah. There's no video you, games. You can't even go out in the middle of the day. You know, That's you're true. a vampire. That's so true. you go out, it's dark out, all businesses are closed. What are you going to do? <laughs> sure. You got to find something. You got to keep You got to keep yourself occupied. Somehow you're going to go crazy. So here's one thing that he did do to keep himself entertained. He kept turning their dead into hand servants and vampire warriors. That made them more useful. Yeah, that's that's fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, he also instigated some very firm rules, which were if one person tried to flee the barony, he would murder 10 people in their place. I, I, well, I think one could argue maybe a bit excessive. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, unsaid in this plot is, yeah, if one person tries to escape, then I murder 10 people. And he goes out, randomly kidnaps them. Yeah. A person and is like, all right, someone tried to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So, so no one tries to escape, but he makes his own. Deal. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just like, yeah. He's what like, are you leaving? He's like bored. He's just bored or whatever. <laughs> or you shape shifts into someone who's like, yeah, I really need you to go like out of town. Go get, go get a horse and cart or whatever. It's like, all right, I guess I gotta kill ten people again. <laughs> it's so annoying. You guys give me no choice, right? Yeah. This is, could you follow the rules? <laughs> They're very clear. Uh, the bear. <laughs> The Baron was aware of the presence of Sarah on the plane, and after the arrival of Faraz, we're going back to these two characters briefly, the Baron meet the two planeswalkers, and he invited them to his castle, as we mentioned previously, yeah. hanging out at the end at night because he doesn't have shit else to do. Cool. Here, he told them that <laughs> since his summoning centuries ago, he has considered Algrotha his new home and warned the two not to interfere with this decree. As we already know, Sarah and Faraz didn't agree with him and started to help out the people of the homelands to develop and to be better to repel the bear and to be better to repel the Baron. Pardon me. Later, when your boy, Aaron, mm-hmm. the Relentless, became the immortal king of the goblins, the Baron tried to tempt him to no avail. OK, he's a tough guy, huh? So the two worked out a deal. Aaron would ensure that the Sengirian villages were getting food and necessities that the growing population could not create themselves, and Baron Senior would take no more hostile actions against the denizens of the Koskun Mountains, which, of course, are the goblins. Yes. So we're brokering some deals now. Right, because, you know, and the, it's a really classic vampire story here, because clearly Baron Senior is evil, and that is what is animating a lot of his actions and decisions. Yes. But reading through the lines... He's also profoundly bored. Oh, he yeah. was probably happy just to be able to sit down and have a conversation with Aaron. I like that. Even if you didn't work out a deal, it was just more about like, yeah, you had to come you had to come here and play a game of chess with me before we can get down to business. Sure. Something like that. I like the idea of him just hanging out at the inn repeatedly, just hoping someone stumbles through. Right. Being like, yo, you want to hang out? You want to hang out, but you can't stop any of my plans. It's like, no, I don't know who you are. And that's a weird thing to say to someone that you just met at a bar. Yeah. Just don't just ignore everything that's going on. A lot of people screaming and dying. Not a big deal. Yeah. Not a big deal. Yeah. My cast is pretty dope, though. Yeah. If you hear some dwarves in the basement screaming, I don't know anything. How would I know anything? 
that's just the the floors are settling. Just had some work done, and it just takes a little while until you know things kind of settle into place. Uh, we also have with the coming of Autumn Willow, Senor sent a new presence in the Great Wood, hostile to him, and started sending his royal hunters through the forest to find out its secret. So Autumn Willow is going to start to play a little bit of a role in things here. Uh, sometime later, the Baron was confronted by a peculiar Sarah Paladin, Lord Ishan who asked the Baron to make a vampire of himself, hoping secretly that in this way he would have had the power to kill Seigneur. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, a little tricksky. The Baron, however, well, saw right through that plan, and instead of turning him into a vampire, he made him into a shade and a faithful servant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Isan, the Baron learned that his raids of terror were giving the people of Asen strength and purpose instead of fear, and that they were united by his hatred of Seigneur. Thus, he stopped his obvious attacks to wait and see if the citizens of Asen, without a common enemy, would collapse and turn on themselves. Okay, it's like the movie The Dark Knight. Okay. In a few years, it began with the persecution of the Death Speakers by the Sarans, a schism fueled by the agents of the Baron. Mm, okay, so he's kind of working all the sides now. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because yeah. this has got to make the game interesting. Yeah, because, again, to reiterate, he's so bored. Yeah. Is there a way to do this a lot more cleanly and less less complicated? Of course. But you got to keep yourself busy. So after Pharaoh's death, who I've mentioned a couple times here, uh, he just died in a lab accident. Uh, again, we know that Pharos is banned as a card, but there's no other Pharos card in Magic. Mm -hmm. So that dude's kind of lame. Uh, he saw Sarah botch a rescue attempt of an old man in the market, and with his poisonous words, he reprimanded her for having interfered, just as Pharos did. Uh, so basically, uh, Sarah botched a rescue attempt, and Baron yelled at her, mm -hmm. and then she's like, all right, I'm out of here. Uh, also, my husband's dead. Cool. Good reason to leave. Uh, so Sarah left Ugratha, and later he sensed the death of his old enemy, Pharaohs, and planted a tree on Pharaohs' grave, which it's kind of passive aggressive. Yeah, that's spiking the football. That's showing up to your hater's funeral <laughs> with, with sunglasses on or whatever. Sure. Yeah, that's what that is. Uh, with most of the powerful enemies now gone, Pharaohs dead, Sarah left after he screamed at her. Uh, Lord Isan tried to trick him, didn't work, and now works for him. And then he's just animating other people. Baron Seigneur remains the true mastermind behind every trouble on the plane. He has spies in Asen who fuel the rift between the Sarans and the Death Speakers. Some of the students in the Wizard School, that's a card, have begun to succumb to his offers of dark power. His faithful hunter Veldrain endlessly stalks the wood, searching for the fabled grove of Autumn Willow. The thieves Joven and Chandler, both cards, sell the artifacts they steal to the highest bidder, unaware that this is none other than the Baron. Yeah. <laughs> arming himself for the future. He has no enemies, but he's arming himself. Even Aaron is unaware that his trade agreement with Asen is tenuous and that many of his guards are secret servants of Seigneur. Yeah. He's playing chess while everyone is playing. I don't even want to say checkers. What are they no, playing? They Marbles? don't even know they don't even know the game they're playing. No, no. You're they have like, no idea what's happening to them. Yeah. You just show up with an artifact to sell the highest bidder. And it's actually the Baron. And the Baron's like one. Now I have a monopoly on all violence. No yep. one can even arm themselves in a vampire. Two, I just hustled that dude. Yeah. Yeah. I would have totally paid more. Probably pass himself in the back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. like like my grandfather coming back from the flea market. This was some piece of trash. And he was like, Yeah, the guy wanted four five dollars for it, tucked him down to four. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the thing is, is that you got a you got a good deal. I got a steal. Yeah. Uh the great plan of the Baron proceeds smoothly. This is the final piece of the puzzle here, folks. He will wait until the population of Asen is firmly divided, and then eliminate Aaron once and for all. Sorry. I know that's your buddy. Yeah. Baron's going to kill him. Uh, throwing Coscoon Keep into chaos. That's where all the goblins live. Uh, when thousands of go when thousands of goblins will begin to starve, they need to eat after all, uh, they'll go where food is easily available. Asen. Many will die traversing Autumn Willow's wood, but enough will live to destroy many of the villagers and farms of Asen. Okay, that's tough. After a few more years of complete misery, the Baron will reappear, turn the weak leaders of the homelands to his control, and offer them a choice. Follow him to a new world through that portal where they can do as they wish or die here in misery, which means he'll finally create the army that he needs to go through the portal. He'll almost assuredly send them through first. And who knows if he'll actually ever go through. Right. No, that's a that's a job for other people. So, you know, magic, you got these planeswalkers. We had Oath of the Gate Watch and we had like War of the Spark and all this stuff. By comparison, all those characters are lame. Yeah. Compared to the Baron? Yeah, Baron's out here dealing. 
he's 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 not only is he dealing, but he's wheeling and dealing. <laughs> he's crushing. Yeah. This is the combination of, of violence, subterfuge, uh, political sway. Okay. Uh just all of it. Yep. This is God. And it's it's not just him interacting with other uh entities of similar power. He's got people down the streets. Oh, he's got it. He's He's got it loaded. All yeah. all layers are covered. Yeah. You uh, you walk into the, the Inn of An Haba, sit down for a drink, and someone sits next to you, and they're like, oh, did you you catch the Packers game yesterday? <laughs> That's a spy. They're trying to find out if you're from out of town. Sure. That's sure. how on lock the Baron has all of this. Incredible. Um, so if we take all of this, all of this story, which, again, Magic has never done anything like this. This rules. Uh, this story is somewhat ridiculous, but a lot of fun, in my opinion. Magic's never done anything close to this in any of the sets leading up to this. And so when we said in the fact section that uh, Homelands took a very flavor first approach, here it is. Mm -hmm. Here it this is. This is a lot of flavor. Yeah. Like they've built all these characters. A lot of these things that I mentioned are in the set as cards. It's like all the cards are horrible, unfortunately, but they're all in the set. And now this is kind of what you see take place in Magic now. You know, you got your legendary creatures, your planeswalkers, whatever, uh, your locations, which are lands, not sorceries. And, you know, Magic does a great job of this now in 2023, but th there was no expectation of this in 1995. No. Unfortunately, it was really hard to find the story that you're describing. Yeah. And, you know, what's, what's nice about, you know, modern technology is that Wizards of the Coast could roll out a bunch of, if not books, at least you know, daily articles, someone on the world building team sort of explaining what's going on here. Yep. You can pick up bits and pieces of the story from the cards, but certainly to know nowhere near the depth of the story actually is. I thought personally that this story was super, super cool. I'm not a big Vorthos or lore, por lore person, excuse me, but I do enjoy just a good story in general. And for someone to come up with this sort of thing in 1995, uh, and basically create all these characters from what's happened thus far in Magic, I think is super rad. Now, how does one take these this story and turn them into Magic cards that matter? Well, this is really the first go at that. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they whiffed. They're much better at it now. But it's quite the ask. Well, I I would push back a little bit on that. Okay. Insofar as if you have a story that is set largely in villages and towns and communities right actually stands to reason that there would be a fair number of vanilla french vanilla low complexity cards okay because a lot of the world is describing just regular people and families who have jobs in some sort of medieval fantasy setting okay sure the problem is that and, and that's certainly there the problem is that you would need to juxtapose that with way more complicated and involved cards at the higher levels to have that contrast between these are the wheelers and dealers of the world. These are the influential characters. And then here are the towns and communities filled with farmers and bakers and that sort of thing. Sure. The, sure. The, to me, the issue is the relative lack of depth on the top level. Okay. And not the fact that there's a lot of, fairly simple cards underneath of that okay okay i buy that um that's it for our flavor lore storyline vorthos section of today's show like i said way more than normal uh, and i had a blast learning about all of this now uh the next couple of sections are going to be a little bit shorter um like mechanics because they don't really have any we're going to go over those or lack thereof right after this All right, everybody, it is now time for the mechanics of Homelands, uh, or as I mentioned, lack thereof, because Homelands introduces no new mechanics. Whoopsie. Uh, it does have some themes, though. Uh, there's some clockwork artifact creatures. Yes. That are, uh, given how much text is on them, weirdly similar. <laughs> uh, there's the clockwork steed. There's the clockwork swarm, and then there's the clockwork have nothing to do with steed or swarm gnomes. Yes. Yeah. I thought this this was a design as a teenager that I thought was weird. <laughs> back then, you, you yeah, yeah. Back then, I was like, 
what you even if you wanted to do this sort of thing, you could imagine, you know, comes into play with a plus one plus one counter, tap, remove the counter to regenerate an artifact creature. Okay. Okay, cool. That's different than a lot of the other clockwork stuff, which is really emphasizing the adding and subtracting of these counters. Yep. But it's at least still speaking the same language. This is just an oddball. You could alternatively just name it something else. I like that alternative. Yeah. You didn't have to use clockwork here. Kind of as we go through stuff like this, it'll kind of show you how the the development process was lacking. Wouldn't someone just go, hey, this doesn't make sense to call clockwork. Uh, yeah. So my so we're already three cards in and I would go, uh, all right, clockwork gnomes. We should definitely not call this clockwork or we should redesign it. have something to do with a plus one plus one counter. Okay. Plus one plus one counter. The other two clockworks, the swarm and the steed. This is at most one design. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> figure out, figure out what weird pseudo evasion you want to put on your clockwork creature. We do it once. <laughs> we'll save the other design for a future set. We can do, we can just put it somewhere else down the line. We don't have to do it right now. We assume there will be future sets. I think we should probably do zero of this. Okay. But if we're going to do it, it's one and not two. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the legendary creatures that were in the set. As I mentioned, there were monocolored legendary creatures. Uh, we got three in white. We have Hazder the Abbot, Roshka the Slayer, and Soraya the Falconeer. In yeah. in black, we have the boss, Baron Sidir, along with his friends, Grandmother Sinir, Ishan Shade. I love the Ishan. Just like, I'm going to trick him. He's like, yeah. nah, you work for me Yeah, now. Nah, he's like, I'm going to trick him. Then Baron Sanger goes, all right, counter offer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's game. Yeah. Uh, Irene Sinier and uh, Veltrain of Sinier, who a dealer, be, a yeah, certified dealer. We'll be getting to. Yeah. Veltrain, oh, yeah. Veltrain a little later in the show. Uh, they got a good catchphrase there. Uh, blue, we've got Reve- uh, Ravika, Wizard Servant. Red, we have Chandler, Aaron the Relentless, and Joven. Three bangers. Yeah, those cards were all really All cool. hitters. Uh, and then green, we have Autumn Willow and then the daughter of Autumn. Uh, this set also had some tribal effects that enhanced only one creature type, which is a little strange. Uh, we have Soraya the Falconeer, in which all Falcons get plus one, plus one, uh, except there's only one Falcon in the set, which is Mesa Falcon. And there was only one Falcon before this in Magic's history, which is Zephyr. So this Falcon. is a, this is, a, this is an example of timing means everything. Okay. So go back to Alpha. All right, let's go back. You got Goblin King and you got, I believe, two goblins in the set. Okay. Mons, Goblin Raiders, and a Goblin Balloon Brigade. I think that's correct. You have Lord of Atlantis and one Merfolk is Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Okay. This is nowhere near enough to build a Goblin or a Merfolk deck. We agree. But first of all, you're sort of like laying out the foundation of, of the of the design space and things we can talk about. And two, it builds anticipation. True. What's to come? I I the next set is coming out. Anything that's a goblin I'm excited about, even if it's not that strong, because I already have some goblin kings I'm working on it. I like the way you're thinking. So now we fast forward, we get now we're at Soraya the Falconeer. Okay. And enough sets are out that you open up Soraya the Falconeer. And remember, this is when information's a little bit shakier. I was there at the time where you go, Oh, are oh, there's gotta be falcons and other sets and i didn't even realize there was going to be a falcon lord now with this new context i can go build a falcon deck and it's like there's no falcon <laughs> baron sanker killed them all there's no there are no falcons soraya the falconeer is unemployed oh for there, sure there's no there's no work for soraya in this world i imagine you know i'm imagining the there's a scene in like training day where someone's calling like a pigeon and like soraya's just calling the falcons whatever you do yeah something like this i'm sure yeah and then just no falcons appear right because they're all dead they're all dead uh there's also you know with the great creature type update there's not many falcons and magic anymore but we're horrendous gonna, we're gonna get to that another another reject another alternate facts uh portion for me uh baron senior regenerated target vampire uh it is worth noting that baron senior is not a vampire mm. it is summoned legend yeah at this point legend was a type and not a super type yes uh, Anaba Ancestor. Oh, this one's one of my favorites. Anaba Ancestor. Uh, it reads target Minotaur gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Uh, well, it's creature type ghost. It was later changed to a Minotaur spirit. Mm-hmm. Probably should be a Minotaur. 
which is interesting to note with the next card here, a novice spirit crafter. All minotaurs get plus one plus zero. Oh. Creature type minotaur. I'm just saying. Did anyone look at the cards before they sent them to print? There's clearly a demarcate. The ancestor is supposed to be dead, and the spirit caller is supposed to be old but alive. Fine. You win that round. Fine. Yeah, I think that you are under an obligation if you're going to go down this road. I think it's better just to call the goblins goblins and not yeah. call them rock slides. Yes. Yes. So, but if you're going to go down this road, I think you have an obligation to name them in a way that clues the person in. Sure. Because an ancestor is not necessarily just a person or entity that has died. You can talk about your, you know, living grandparents and great grandparents as your ancestors, right? Yes. So that name is uh, specifically crafted to create confusion. If it was Anaba ghost or Anaba soul of Anaba, there you, you might get clued in. Yeah. Okay. Maybe this is not necessarily a minotaur. Okay. So that's a mistake. And magic does a lot of this early on. If you're going to do this, some things are minotaurs and some things are not, you need to be naming more precisely than ancestor, I, in my opinion. Uh, we've got the Dwarven Pony. Uh, that one uh, gives a dwarf mountain walk until end of turn. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got ourselves the Willow Priestess. Take a fairy from your hand and put it directly into play as though it were just summoned. Yeah, show and tell. Yeah, <laughs> fairy show and tell. It's show and tell. Uh, and then dig Didgeridoo. Uh huh. That's also show and tell. Yeah, that's a minotaur show and tell. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a minotaur from your hand and put it directly into play as though it were just summoned. Yeah, it's cool because if you uh, uh, tap it in three to put in a four, you're cheating by one mana. Mm -hmm. But if the four really should only cost two, then you're really not cheating any mana. You're being cheated. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels like you're getting away with something awesome when it's actually the opposite of yeah, that. You're not really accomplishing much of anything. You think but that's it's okay? You think it's your reward for being smart when really it's your punishment for being stupid. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Homelands also has many creature types that are unique to the creatures they are found on. Many of these are real world animals and types of people, grounding this expansion more in the real world than other expansions. Uh, so we have creature types introduced in Homelands. I'm going to name the creature type it was later changed to. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to tell me the card. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll keep score. I'm sure there will be sound effects and many other things. Uh, albatross later changed to bird. Uh, the giant albatross? One for one. We're calling it. That's it. Okay. Uh, no, we have alchemist later changed to cleric. Uh, I don't know. Samite alchemist. Okay. Ambush party later changed to rogue. Ambush party. That is correct. Autocrat later changed to human. Sanger autocrat. That is correct. Badger. Rysorian badger. Correct. Bureaucrat later changed to advisor. Eastern bureaucrat. That is correct. Caravan later changed to nomad. Mm. Merchant caravan. The answer is trade caravan. Pretty close. It's not bad. That's not, not bad. bad. Trade and mercantile is like adjacent. Still incorrect, but not yeah, bad. yeah, yeah. Uh, carriage later changed to horsey. Black carriage. That's correct. Uh, constable later changed to human. Unhaba constable. That is correct. Uh, crusader later changed to human knights. Uh, Ace and Crusader. That's correct. You can just guess city name. Yeah, and mostly get these right. Well, yeah. The, the, so the ones that are more citizen reoriented are on Hava. Okay. And the ones that are a little more militaristic are Ace. How There's about like a, kind of a theme there? How about a ferret? Jovan's ferret. That's correct. Big flavor fail. This has nothing to do with artifacts. This was another design that bothered me as a kid. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I was like, why is like Jovan's ferret should obviously be like stealing small artifacts, right? Yeah, for Jovan. Yeah, yeah. It's like like, uh, and also you could have come up with some really sweet, um, you know, it, it destroys artifacts, but if it costs zero, you take them. It okay. Been like a little mock sleeve or whatever. I could be fun. Like little beats of jewelry and whatever. Sure. Yeah, but it really bothered me as a kid that Jovan's ferret. Said, I guess I was always a game designer. When people ask me how to become a game designer, I guess I always was one because that fifteen year old me was like, why does Jovan's ferret have nothing to do with artifacts? <laughs> who makes these cards yeah. I don't understand why would this ferrets be green and yeah. have nothing to do with artifacts it makes no sense uh, Folk of On Hava later changed to Townsfolk Folk of On Hava That's one great. of my all time favorites A uh, Hound later changed to Dao I, I think I still remember the flavor text on that one Folk of On Hava yeah okay I'll challenge you hold on hold well on. there's two arts but I remember the art on the one that I used okay we'll get to the dog one in a second so Folk of On Hava is a green card and so I used the one where they're dancing in the pile of dirt yep got it uh, 
this town is for good folks. The rest can go to the city. I'm going to give it to you. It's close enough. What is it? This town's only for good folk. Only for good folk, right. The rest can go to the city is correct. And then there's the second one, which basically doesn't exist to you, which is there are those who accept being told what to do, what to think, and what to say. Then there are the folk of Von Hava. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Yeah. That person's not having it. Yeah. A little too militaristic for me. Okay. Yeah. A little too reactionary. I greatly enjoy I like that. the other. I like the other one with the person playing the harmonica in the dirt. Oh, you got to get down. Yeah. There's not much to live for when Baron's reigning over you. So keep in mind that I grew up in a pretty rural area in New Jersey. So that art and flavor text really stuck with me because I was like, yeah, that's right. They can go to New York or Philly. <laughs> that's where the rest of them go. They can get out of here. All the, 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 the lunatics can get out of here. Uh, we got Hound later changed to dog. Uh, don't know. Ghost Hounds. Ghost Hounds. Inquisitor later changed to cleric uh i'm gonna just in the dark ace and inquisitor sarah inquisitor. Sarah, sarah okay a lizard uh it jumps oh leaping lizard that's correct mist later changed to elemental uh hungry fog hungry mist hungry mist that's correct Hungry fog. Hungry fox. Hungry fog is not any more <laughs> any more ridiculous than hungry mist. It sounds funny. Hungry fog. Uh narwhal later changed to whale. Narwhal? That's correct. Noble later changed to fairy. Oh, the uh show and tell guy. I mean yeah. <laughs> walking show and tell. The, <laughs> if you put the two words together, you might get the name of the card. Fairy noble. There it is. Oyster. Giant oyster. Pony, later changed to horse. Dwarven pony. And speaker, later changed to cleric. You're not getting it. Uh, Death speaker? Okay, death speakers, but you did get death it. Death speakers. I think you only got three wrong there. So that's actually pretty really good. good. That's pretty good. For that's homelands, good. it's pretty good. Uh, Yeah, a real lack of mechanics here, as you can see. A real lack of... I think, it, I think you really actually put it best at the beginning of the show. A real lack of anything interesting. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the, the big one. So, I, like, one that I want to... Uh, point out here is hungry mist as an example of this or hungry fog so i uh, part of it is power level we've talked about power level yeah but it's not entirely about power level and this is a good example of this this card is not strong yep at all yep uh but it's something to think about okay. at the time getting six power for four mana in green was not really a thing that you could do okay and I mean, part of that is like this is basically a black design. It shouldn't be in green. But set that aside. This is a card that I looked at when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, I wonder what, what could I do with this? I was like, okay. So if someone's not playing with any creatures, it's actually pretty efficient. If you're it's attacking, huge. If you're attacking clean. Okay. Uh, it's pretty good in terms of uh, something to berserk. Because, again, getting six power for four mana is not common. And giving trample to your... 12-2 is a powerful thing to be doing. Okay. So even though this card is weak, never showed up in any sort of tournament setting, I'm not sure I even ever cast it myself. This gave me something to think about. Okay. So many of the cards in here are so boring. There's yeah. just nothing to latch on to. And so, yes, some of it is power level. It would be useful if some of the cards were stronger. But also, even if that wasn't a thing, just having more hungry miss, more like, Oh, all right. Something to think about. Yeah, There's something sure. going on here. Okay. It's got some characteristics I can maybe leverage. Uh, the set is really lacking on that as well. And that's that's really rough. Well, everybody, those are the mechanics of Homelands. We're going to be moving on to Cycles next. And if you thought this portion of the show was short, just wait till we get to the next one. All right, everybody, it is now time for the cycles of Homelands. Now, we've talked about how this set is, uh, well, it lacks interest. It's somewhat boring. One could argue it's a little bit phoned in. Here's more of an example of that. Homelands has one cycle and one partial cycle. And the cycle that we're about to talk about is not good. Tricolor lands. Let's talk about them. Uncommon lands with tap at a colorless. You can pay one mana and tap it to add a color, or you can pay two mana and tap them to add a different color. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. I'm so, yeah. To so laugh. to translate into modern times, please do. This is 
five way, way, way worse shimmering grottos. Okay. Okay. So now that we've laid that out. Yes. These are designs that I do appreciate, though, at the time. Okay. This is new design space. And often when you're doing something new, it doesn't have to be powerful because the novelty of it being new can carry the day. Yes. So starting with Alpha, we have the original duels. Yep. Way too powerful. Super good. Super good. Yes. Then you go to Arabian Nights and you have uh, lands that have for colorless, lands that don't have for mana, and City of Brass. Five color land, but an obvious drawback on it. Yep. Now you go to Antiquities, everything's colorless. Okay. Um, Fallen Empires has uh, Rainbow Veil as a five color land. Again, pretty extreme drawback on it. And then the uh, some of the enters play tap lands and uh, storage lands and so on. Ice Age, you have the depletion lands and you have the pain lands appearing for the first time. So this is the first set of lands that have the ability to tap for three colors of mana and don't have a drawback other than they tap for colorless. Sure. So they have a purpose. Because even though, yes, obviously these are way weaker than Savannah and Tundra, there isn't a land that lets you tap for green, white, or blue with no penalty to use it in the game's history. So, yes, really weak. Yes, it's it's bad to the point that it really doesn't even fulfill the purpose because you can't play these in three-color decks. You're better off just playing literally any basic land. Yeah. Setting aside playing with pain lands and dual lands and whatever else, City of Brass, whatever you're trying to do. Yep. But uh, these are new in their own way and given that so much of the set is so derivative it's just old ideas that aren't even really rehashed or respun it's just old ideas all over the place yep. this is actually some amount of let's figure out a cycle of lands that has some purpose that's different than stuff we've done in the past so the thing i like about these the most is from a storyline perspective and so far as uh when i was reading the lore aspect of things all of these cards are from the lore. Yes. So Castle Seigneur, Costco and Keep, which is where the goblins hang out, Wizard School, which was created by uh, Pharaohs, Anhava Township, we've talked about Anhava at length, and Ace and Abbey, well, we've talked about the city of Ace and quite a bit. So I actually think that's cool. It is. Uh, you know, the fact that these cards are terrible just kind of is what it is. I do agree with you that you're probably just better off playing basic lands instead of these. Mm-hmm. But I, I also agree with you that, like, you know, at least they're trying to open up the design space at least a little. And I really like your point about the names. Let's let's compare it to the 10 dual lands in Ice Age. None of them tell you anything about the world except for Atacar Waste and Carplusion Forest. Sure. The rest of them are Underground River, Brushland. Sulfurous Springs. Yeah, these are all just generic. They say nothing about the world. Yeah. They're just, you know, easily replicated just bits of terrain. These, to your point, are all specific parts of the story that matter. Yep. And differentiating them by the colors is a cool thing to do, too. It clues you in. Oh, Sanger must be black because this is the primary black land. Oh, uh, Aeson must be white because it's the primary white land. Like, it's not just flavor. It's actually telling you something meaningful about the world, too, which is really great. Uh, We also have an incomplete cantrip cycle. Uh, that is the one partial cycle here. Um, the common, the c- common cantrip spell, excuse me. Uh, there is no red common cantrip. The only red homeland spell that allows the caster to draw one card is winter sky. Uh, and these four cards are prophecy, jinx, headstone, and renewal. Headstone, pretty useful card. Prophecy, probably one of the five strongest cards in the set because it's just one cost draw card <laughs> the next turn, which probably puts it in the top five. Uh, I, I especially like the artwork. Yeah, because uh, Ishan Shade is staring at you and is not. I think staring at uh, whoever is on the receiving end of this because he's so mad that he got tricked by. The yeah, he just got bamboozled. Yeah, I also really like the the card prophecy. That's like, all right, look at the top card of their deck. Okay, that's definitely that's a prophecy. I get that vibe. You're about to see it in the future. Yep. Now shuffle. Yeah. So yeah, they don't really know anything. <laughs> Put it away. I'm here to inconvenience you. Yes. And then I will draw a card at the beginning of your next turn's upkeep. Well, next turn, next turn's upkeep, I'm going to forget to draw a card. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Uh, Homelands also, uh, by the by, has 23 cards that are so nice, they printed them twice. In white, Abbey Falcon, Mesa Falcon, and Trade Caravan, which actually means, by the way, uh, that Mesa Falcon, since they printed it twice, 
Saray the Falconeer has got a little extra help. Yeah. They don't it, let you play eight, though. I think they could make an exception. They should. Yeah. They really should. Should have, like, the Relentless Rats clause. Uh, blue, Dark Maze, Giant Albatross, Labyrinth Minotaur, the Incredibly Fun Memory Lapse, and Reef Pirates. Black, there was Cemetery Gate, Dry Spell, Feast of the Unicorn, Senior Bats, and Torture. In red, we had uh, Aliban's Tower, Ambush Party, Anaba Bodyguard, Anaba Shaman, and Dwarven Trader. And then in green, we had Carapace, Folk of Anhava, Hungry Mist, Shrink, and Willow Fairy. Again, so nice, they printed them twice. Those are the cycles for Homelands, everybody. Um, I keep saying, or lack thereof, which gets kind of old saying that, but it's just consistently true. Yeah, there's just not a lot of juice here. No. Where's the juice? We don't have much juice. What we do have, though, coming up next is a boatload of trivia for you. You get to learn some things about arguably Magic's worst set right after this. All right, everybody. It is now time for the trivia of Homeland. Sometimes there's some misprints thrown in here as well, but I'm basically trivia focused this time around. So uh, gather around and learn some things that you almost certainly did not know. And maybe you shouldn't know because uh, eh, some of this stuff is cool. Some of it isn't. Abby Gargoyles and Hazder the Abbot both have the greatest combined power and toughness among white creatures in Homelands. Three, four. Correct. Well done. Uh, Abby Gargoyles and Sea Sprite are the first creatures with both flying and protection from red. Abby Gargoyles was the largest creature with protection from red until Sabretooth Nishoba. And the Ooh. largest creature... <laughs> that car was a banger. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Buddy. yeah, and the largest creature with both of these abilities until Iridescent Angel. Mm. Hitters. Uh, what was your response when you first saw Iridescent Angel? At that point, I was too good at magic to be tricked. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. It's so cool. It is so cool, but I was past that point. I'd already played on the Pro Tour at this, at this okay. point. Okay. All right. So. I remember the first time I saw this thing, I'm like, this is the best card I've ever seen in my entire life. Sorry. I should say Odyssey was the newest set when I played in my first Pro Tour. Okay. So, yes, uh, it was cool. And there was part of me that was like, oh, wow, that's a sweet design. Yeah. But I was never tricked into thinking you could play it constructed. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Aliban's Tower was named after an anonymous friend of the head designer. Uh, if I designed card games, I'd name cards after my friends, too. Yeah, I've worked on friends' card games who have named cards after their friends and never for me. Can I tell you a little uh, little bit of trivia uh, please on, do. on this topic? Yes. So back in the day, I was a, the... Uh, development lead for the world of warcraft trading card game yes maybe 10 15 years ago i played that and, game some yeah uh and so a lot of names in the card game were vanity names people who worked on the project over here or over at blizzard maybe it was their character's name from world of warcraft maybe it was sort of a reference to their partner or their kids whatever okay you want to have their their names in the game and we do our best to incorporate it as we can. Okay. But a lot of people, it was not enough to have their name on a card. Oh, boy. They were like, it's my card good. You need to make oh, my card good. come on. People were Blizzard. Okay. They need to make my card good. So to put an end to all of this, the first time that I made my own card, a card named Sullivan Holmes, just like easily the worst card in the set. Okay. And I was like, I'm in charge of power level. This is how good my card is. No one ever talked to me about this ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so I sabotage. No, I mean I didn't really care. I like it's not it clearly it would be weird. Care. It would be weird for me to care about my card being in people's decks. Sure. But I did purposefully sabotage my own card so no one could ever ask me about the power level of their card ever again. Yeah, we're done with this. Yeah, we're done with this. Yeah. Sullivan Holmes, look at this piece of garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Your card will be of equal power level. Yeah. It has an ability that's hard to use, like hard to get on, and then isn't even good if you do it. Nice. That's the way I do it. That's, that's I like how it. I do it. I like it. Uh, Anzaren Ruins is the first card that allows a player to choose a creature type and truly began the continuing crusade to change creature types into more useful types. Oh, right. We have to get to the great creature. Ugh, gosh. I hate this. I know. I'm getting to it. Uh, Apocalypse Chime is the last expansion hosing card to be printed. The others are... Sidney of uh Gyalothian Silex. Golgothian Silex. Golgothian Silex. It's a That's weird right. word, yeah. but yeah, you got it. Uh, Autumn Willow was the first creature with Shroud, the so inability awesome. to be targeted by spells or abilities. So good. Good card. So much fun. 
People love this thing, even though it wasn't good. Because Shroud is like, oh, you can't even, like, you can't kill my thing? That's great. It's like, oh, maybe you've got some creature enchantments. You want to put a giant growth in this? you got a window to do it, too. This is just awesome. Uh, Ace and Crusader had only three heroes to power it up. Banalish hero, Kel'joran hero, and Beast Walkers. But it is worth noting that in the great creature type update, pardon me, the grand creature type update, its type was changed from Crusader to Knight, and rather than heroes, it gained a bonus from soldiers and warriors, making it substantially more viable. So let's I, let's let's get into it. This is this is I'm I'm not joking here. This is maybe from just a pure game design side, the thing that Wizards has done that I hate the most. Okay. Just straight up. Functional errata. It's functional errata all over the place. Okay. And a lot of the stuff just so you could move forward in the future, whatever your line is where you're like, okay, we got all these creature types and they're not really compatible. And it's weird that we have birds and falcons and pigeons. Okay, fine. I agree. That's all weird. Sure. What you can do is just create the world that you want going forward. Okay. And not worry so much about whether or not Soraya the Falconeer has cards to play with in the future. It just doesn't matter that much relative to the functional errata of it. And the only reason to do this is to put a spotlight on the functional errata. There's no reason to do this other than, yeah, we want people to play with the old Falcons in their bird deck. Sure. So you just have cards in play. Like the point is to put cards in play where their text box is in the line with reality. And there's no way to have, I mean, maybe you can guess a lot of these instances, but there's no way to know without just having the manual that tells you what has been changed into what. It's a little confusing if you're playing with the old cards and people are like, that doesn't work that way. And it's like, actually, it does. Uh, actually, it's a it's a uh, actually this thing that talks about heroes. It means soldiers and warriors. Mm -hmm. And uh, this banal here over here that says hero on it. That's a soldier now. So they work <laughs> together. Yeah. It's like awful. I'm, I don't want to play anymore. This I'm is leaving. annoying. Just tell me what your cards do. Well, actually, let just let the cards do what yeah, they just say so they do. can i read it and like no yeah there's a, it's just weird to be bound by uh here's an example the tabernacle at pendrel vale okay you know that it's destroy and not sacrifice right i am just learning that now it is not the most intuitive thing right because for the most part those kind of effects are pay one or sacrifice it yeah so yeah. a creature with indestructible cannot be killed by the tabernacle Okay. That is something that actually comes up sometimes uh, in Legacy. Dark Depths token. Because of Dark Depths. Yep. Uh, the Abyss targets. That's another thing that's pretty strange because the card says, like, uh, it, it follows sort of the structure of sacrificing. So is the answer to this, that that's weird, it works this way, do you just say, those are two old weirdos, it doesn't really matter that much, just let them be a little bit weird? Or do you errata them to sacrifice? To me, it's berserk to suggest doing the second <laughs> thing. Sure. And sure. The, this, the, the creature type thing is, it's like doing the second thing, but instead of on two cards, it's on hundreds, sure. maybe thousands. I don't even it's know. It's probably way more than we realize. Yeah. I know there's good reasons to do it, but this is... A, I have never got on board with the arguments for having done this. That said, not my call. The reality we live in is the reality we live in. Also, I'm glad this isn't my call because can you imagine tasking someone to, hey, go back no, and fix know, these yeah, cards? Yeah. But, you know, I got, I got, we have a YouTube channel and I got a mic on. So if I want to spend five minutes just sort of ripping on this, this is my opportunity to do so. By all means. Not a, not a, not a fan of this. Uh, life is a highway. And on the Aeson Highway, it gives all white creatures Planeswalk, which is unusual due to the rarity of Planeswalk in comparison to other Landwalk abilities. Yeah, Planeswalk's really bad. Two reasons. Yeah. One, um, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, things live inside mountains. Mountains are normally hard to navigate, but there are creatures that live and thrive there. Or someone is really good at navigating mountains. Yes. And so this person yeah, you has have a guide. mountain walk. Yeah, yeah you have a, a, a hiker, a yeah. guide. Makes sense. Um, swamps. Swamps are hard to traverse, but some creatures really thrive swimming through muck water uh, or, you know, jumping from branch to branch in a forest. Uh, swimming is a really easy conceit for Island Walk. 
traversing water is some things that creatures do better than others. Yeah. Plans is like defined by the absence of anything. So something being really good at traversing this wide open expanse doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Also a bad word to use in the game with planes walkers. I like the idea of being, I'm the best at walking in an open field. Yeah. No one's better than me at this. Yeah. Well, shout out to graceful antelope. Yeah. Because yes, planes walk is weird, but I remember when I saw graceful antelope and I'm like, yeah, I buy it. Yeah, sure. It's like bouncing. It's, you know, it's my house. Yeah. It's so graceful. I'm just doing my thing out. Yeah. Here. Uh, graceful antelope rules in spite of planes walk being very weird. Uh, let's talk about Baron Sneer real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, has the greatest combined power and toughness among black creatures in homelands. That's a lie. It is tied with this on shade. It's true. Keep forgetting to update that. Okay, well, what what's their power and toughness? Five, five. Okay, good. Good job by you. Uh, at the time it was printed, it did not have the vampire creature type. Uh, it was summon legend, but it did have a super-powered vampire ability and the ability to re- regenerate target vampire. Unfortunately, there were no vampires printed in Homelands, and Senior Vampire and Kravakid Vampire were the only vampires in existence at the time uh, in the Grand Creature Type update. However, its type was changed to vampire and its ability changed to regenerate another target vampire. Mm -hmm. Now look. Look. It's one thing with the Crusader, change heroes, all that jazz. Okay, I don't love it. Actually, I I hate it. But now we've just gone from regenerate another target vampire. I get it. You don't want the Baron to be able to regenerate itself. But actually, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't bother me any. It's eight mana. Let it live. Not even a good card. I don't like it regenerating itself because I think it changes the story from this is a lord of all vampires to this is some sort of survivalist. You don't think that wheeler and dealer didn't learn along the way how to regenerate himself? I think he did. I I just I the, obviously you can argue it for plainly on power level, and I'm sure there's a story that you can tell like that too. But I kind of like other. I just would just not turn it into a vampire. Sure. Just, again, stop. Just stop. Arri- At least with Baron Sanger, it's pretty obvious. Like, yeah, it's probably a vampire. Like, if they arrive all the legends, there's a ton of legends where it would not be clear what it became. That's true. Yeah, that's this true. Is, but yeah, I. To recap, I hate all this creature type. <laughs> I would change Baron Sanger to creature type, like manipulator. Yeah, or something that just shows that he's such a boss. Uh, uh, dealer. That works. Dealer. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Uh, Beast Walkers is the last hero to be printed, which was unfortunate for Ace and Crusader until the stupid update. Okay, great. Uh, Chandler and what do we think? Joven or Hoven or Joven? I've always pronounced it Joven. All right. So Chandler and Joven mirror each other as three, three red legendary creatures with a converted mana cost of five and activated ability to destroy either artifact creatures or non-creature artifacts for a cost of red, red, red and tap. Those cards are cool. Clockwork Gnomes is the first artifact gnome and does not have the typical clockwork mechanic of adding or removing plus one, plus one counters, plus one, plus oh counters, I think, uh, despite its name. Uh, Clockwork Steed is a miniature version of Clockwork Beast that also cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. And Clockwork Swarm is a miniature version of Clockwork Avian that also cannot be blocked by walls. This is uh, another effort by Magic, and there's been so many over the years to recapture the magic of Juggernaut, failing to realize that part of the magic of Juggernaut is its simplicity. And its name. Yes. I think that's a big part of Juggernaut. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Didgeridoo is an um, aboriginal instrument that creates a deep drowning sound, which I actually knew. Uh, Dwarven Sea Clan has an ability that, like Desert, can only be used at the end of the combat step, Mm -hmm. which we don't see very often in magic, for good reason. But, you know, it does come up occasionally. It's correct to do it this way, certainly in the instance of Desert. Just too bad if this can be activated in the middle of combat. Yeah. So for balance reasons, it makes sense to do end of combat. So, yeah, you get to do your thing, but your opponent still got the total sum of whatever their attack was worth. Um, I don't like putting a spotlight on the end of combat phase because it's weird anytime anyone brings it up in a game the other person's gonna think they're cheating like sure just made up this phase we're still in combat even after damage has occurred it's actually even even me the spikiest of people i remember playing with desert and just being like okay so after damage is dealt still inside combat at end of combat it sounds made up yeah it's just like what did you just say so my creature's still attacking 
Uh, technically, yes. We've already resolved damage. Also true. But I have an effect. I'm I, so, I don't believe How that. can I still be attacking? Yeah. You're right. It doesn't make sense because, yes, I, it's very obvious when I attack that I'm attacking. It's very obvious that when you block, this thing is still attacking because how else can you block? Yeah. And then we've dealt damage. Everything's happened. Anything that says when this creature deals combat damage, do X, Y, Z has resolved. Well, we're almost through. We're almost Hang through. On, just but give me, I got a little give me, something. Uh, deal one damage to your elf. Um, Ebony Rhino has the greatest combined power and toughness among artifact creatures in Homelands. Four or five. Correct. Aaron the Relentless has greatest uh, combined power and toughness among red creatures in Homelands. Five, two. That's correct. This card's so cool. Uh, Faroz's ban was later reprinted in fifth edition, although it was mistakenly on the reserved oh, list at the wow. time. There's just a lot to unpack there. So uh, this is going to win an award for me later in the show. A little spoiler for you there. Uh, card is heinous. It's absolutely terrible. And they felt the need to bring it back from and not fun. Yeah. yeah. Also that you want to cast creatures. Tough, tough. Uh, Ghost hounds is the only monocolored black creature with vigilance. Cool. I wanted to back up just one moment. Our Pharaoh's band. Look, we can stay with the I've, band. Uh, I've been doing some thinking. Okay. And it's, uh, it has to be easily the, the funniest way in vintage to lock out a dredge player is to tinker or cast for us as bad. They, they can blow it up with forces. That's so they can way. still do some stuff. They can, right? but they can't play any, the, the conventional list cannot do anything. Okay. Well, so just something to keep in mind. If you're looking for style points, if you're out there and you lock someone in vintage with Feroz's don't band, do this. you tag me. Don't do this. Please do not do this. A uh, heart wolf was named in, homage to of the throat wolf legend okay so <laughs> for those of you who are unaware of the throat wolf legend and uh, heavens knows i did not know anything about this the throat wolf is perhaps the most famous hoax related to magic the gathering it was the legend of a non-existent card in many variations of the story the throat wolf was an extremely rare card usually a creature card described as having double first strike which is basically a thing in magic now because there is double strike or firstest strike. Various versions continue to circulate on the internet, usually with obscure or technically impossible rules text. Uh, there's a history of this card. If you search the MTG fandoms or Wikipedia's, uh, Throat Wolf was finally printed with firstest strike as a test card in the mystery booster set, which I believe Gavin Verhey led, or at least had a very heavy hand in. Um, this sort of thing would never happen now. Which... I don't know if that's good or bad. Like that this sort of thing, it's like, hey, do you guys see uh do you uh you see Throat Wolf? And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like now, this would just be like someone has taken a picture of and put it on the internet. It's like yeah. when remember like when the first time like a serialized card came out and it's just like, Do you see this thing? And it's like, what are you talking about? And it's like, oh, just go on Reddit or whatever and like an imager and there's a picture. That's what would happen with Throat Wolf now. But back in the day, you could just make up stuff. Yeah. And it's just like this thing's real. It's a lost art. It's it, it is it yeah. is right like even trying to explain this to someone who like is born like the two thousands it's like you know what we could do back in our day just make shit up mm -hmm. and then you couldn't prove us wrong right how about that pretty rad actually uh anyway that's the legend of the throat wolf hungry mist greatest combined power and toughness among green creatures in homelands six deuce there you go uh, Ishan Shade was one of five uncommon former ice age block japanese language cards offered as a promotion in japan along with goblin mutant kravakan vampire surge of strength and yavamaya ants as worth noting that the ice age block was not released in japan iron claw curse references the ability of iron claw orcs jinx was named as part of an inside joke referencing one of the quote words of power end quote in quote the game end quote played by members of the research and development team I don't know. Guys couldn't just work on the set instead. Yeah. Yeah, I would be annoyed if I was their boss with a lot of this. Just a scotch? Yeah, just uh, could you can you give me a solid 90 minutes? I'm not asking for much. No. Just an hour and a half of really focusing in on improving a handful of cards. I know you can do it. Uh Jovan's ferrets shares the doesn't untap uh, next turn mechanic found on many snakes in the Kamigawa block. Labyrinth Minotaur is the only monocolored blue Minotaur. 
Leeches is the only card in Homelands to reference poison counters. In fact, the card removes poison counters, and yet the expansion contains no means for a player to gain poison counters. Leeches is an awesome Vorthos design. Okay. It's like, you've got, you're, you're poisoned? I am. All right, I have leeches to get rid of it. And leeches just kills you. It does. Because back then, all the poison effects still dealt regular damage. So if you had nine poison on you, it meant you you had taken at least nine points of combat damage as well. So, like, a leech is a real-life thing. This was right? a, a thing that people did back in the day. Yeah. Do they still exist? Leeches? Do you still think like, leeches are just still out there in the world? Definitely. My uh, my kids, some of my kids were at a uh, farm camp over the summer, and they, like, saw leeches oh. and talked about them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's not, it's really, um, the science behind leeches is really bad. When I think of leeches, I think of the movie, like, The Mummy. Uh-huh. I don't actually think of them being like a thing that exists in the real world. No, they're real. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Leaping Lizard was based on the first joke card that appeared online with the same name. <sighs> cool. Work on the set. Yeah. <laughs> Do your job. Do your job. Uh, Marhan was the greatest combined power of toughness among all creatures in Homelands. Say it. There you go. Uh, Memory Lapse was designed as part of the reverse cantrip. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Reverse game. I forgot. We went, uh, over, we yeah. went over this earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's imagine, imagine if someone was like, yeah, I designed Stone Rain as the reverse mana ram yeah, strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Discard is the reverse card draw. Yes, exactly. Uh, memory Lapse was designed as part of the reverse cantrip cycle of Mirage and was moved to Homelands after another card was removed from the set. Great. Glad to have you here. Yeah. Really uh, fun. Uh, so... I think magic is trying to like get out from under counter spell a little bit. Yeah. So this is the type of thing that if you're really bad at magic, you're like, Oh, this is way worse than counter spell. But once you get good, uh, you realize that it's comparable to counter spell. And the real kicker is that, you know what memory elapse is very good with counter spell. Yeah. So a big swing and a miss right here. Memory lapse. It's weird to say this, that card is one of those. Once you start to understand magic, you're like, oh, my God. Yes. How Like, it's one of those cards that, like, I guess the best way to put it is once you start to understand the game, you view that card. and You're just like, this card is completely absurd. But when you don't know the game that well, you're just like, I just get to do my thing again. It's exactly. Kind of yeah. Deal. Yeah. This is this is a sign that the people who were charged with developing the set fundamentally do not understand magic. Sure. Cause like this card should never be made in any meaningful way. Now I remember they made the reprint lapse of certainty. Uh, they made it in white. Three man is so different. It's a from huge two. difference, yeah. right? Like it's yeah. gigantic difference. Um, and, and that card was not a competitive zero at three. No, no, yeah. I, I played it sometimes yeah. on the Kithkin sideboard. Right. Like, like it wasn't good. It's but... still good against five mana cards. Like yeah. it doesn't have to be memory lapse to be yeah. good against. You got it. you got a hollow burial for me. Well, I got something Bang. for you, bud. And I'll finish you off with these mutavolts or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, um, let's go to primal order. It's the second card to reference non basic lands, and the first green card to do the same. The name references the primal order, a role playing uh, game produced in the early days of Wizards of the Coast. Uh, Root Spider is the first of only a few spiders to have power equal or greater than its toughness. Others include Plated Spider, Goliath Spider, uh, Aqua Strand Spider, Needle Peak Spider, Gloom Widow, Sentinel Spider, Arc Weaver, oh, Sky Snare Spider, and wait, hold on. Willing Test Subject. Okay, I don't know that one. Uh, you just ruined my flow. Sorry. Oh, this is a fake card. Yeah, obviously. <sighs> Wish that wasn't in the final cut of this show. Yeah, I just, I just, I just love hearing a, ri- a list of Magic's front heavy spiders yeah. over the years. Got the whole thing. So good. Uh, Retorothopter is an upgrade of Ornithopter, but with the cost of one instead of zero. They both receive the creature type Thopter later in the Grand Creature Type updates. Uh, I think one could argue that it's actually not an upgrade of Ornithopter. It's way worse. I also want to know what was the game in playtesting where someone spent six. And pumped it a third time. And the other person was like, this is messed up. (laughs) I I have to, I have to assume it's a flavor thing. Like this is a small object. 
and magic at this point has a history of baby dragons and that sort of thing like there's a cap to how much you could pump them okay but i i so i hope it's that but part of me thinks that it was like a power level thing i bet it was someone was playing with this and this was like their tron payoff right and then like one of the east coast play testers was no more yeah we got to cap this thing out i'm not taking five from this thing again yeah yeah that's probably what it was yeah this is so stupid because once you have tron and then you play another tower it's like for five it's too much yeah. it's just too much uh the badger Rasorian badger mm-hmm. was named for editor and assistant director of the duelist convocation uh reese hall who was also known at the time as auntie badger cool uh serrated arrows oh god Mm. Saw tournament play. And I'm just thinking of the nickname. Sorry. Yeah. So let me read this really yeah, quick. Serena yeah. Arrow saw tournament play not only as a result of the high prevalence of cards like Order of the Ebon Hand and Standard of the Time, but also because imagine this, gamers. There was a short lived rule requiring constructed tournament decks to include at least five cards from each legal set. Yeah, this was known at the time as the home decapped rule. <laughs> Which but I obviously, you know, cancel culture came and ruined that. Can't call that. it. Can't call that anymore. No, this was a horrible nickname at the time. Um, but yeah, you had to play five homelands cards in your deck, so a lot of it was four serrated arrows plus one of the lands was a pretty common setup. That's a good way. You of can play it. them just in the board, right? Yeah, 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 you just, yeah in the sideboard. Okay. okay. Although serrated arrows, as your note mentions, this was sort of a high water mark for one toughness creatures. One hundred creatures with protection from color. Yeah. And so Serrated Arrows was a very useful card at the time. Okay. Uh, Shrink introduced the power reduction mechanic in green, which was later moved to blue. That's where we oftentimes see your minus four, minus O's and draw a card type of thing. Uh, Serrated the Falconeer became more powerful when Falcon and other creature types were condensed to bird. No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, did not, that did not happen. <laughs> Tamirian feeds is the oh, nice, I forgot it. It's is the, the last <laughs> hurrah for anti. <laughs> the ninth and final card uh, to have an anti-effect, anti-effect. Excuse me. Uh, Trade Caravan was named in honor of the Watsi Caravan Tour, an early promotional tour of Wizards of the Coast employees and contracted artists. Uh, to stores in order to promote magic. I don't know. Why don't you just work on the set? Yeah, that's also really weird. You're just putting Richard Garfield on a bus and driving him around the LGS. <laughs> Please play with <laughs> Homelands. <laughs> Please play. <laughs> Please play with this set. Uh, all right. It's time for our buddy, Veldrain of Seniors, the only model by creature to ever have activatable forest walk. Yeah. Fuck you. Take two. Bang. This card. Uh... <laughs> Like, can we just get the game over with? It's seven. No, 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 no. It's like, do it. Can we just? I promise you, a thing that we can do is play another game. How about let's just get this one over? How about you're at 14 now? No, 12. Yep, 10. Clock's ticking, green mage. Uh, Winter Sky. Our last note here is the unique card is a unique card with the coin flip mechanic because both of its potential effects are symmetrical. Uh, the card is probably up on the screen right now, but in case you don't know, if Winter Sky is single red, sorcery, flip a coin. If you win the flip, Winter Sky deals one damage to each creature and each player. And if you lose the flip, each player draws a card. Sweet. Sure. Yeah, no bad outcomes. That's a rare. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> quite poor. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's also my favorite kind of coin flip card which is uh when you are when you want one effect you really don't want the other (laughs) sure sure (laughs) yeah that's a i really need to kill all these one toughest creatures well another card's coming Uh, i really need to find some action uh nothing happens yeah nothing happens you take one uh my final note here in my uh miss prince trivia all this stuff you may have seen during a chronicles episode everybody that i uh May have pointed out something about Nate and its lack of capitalization. Hmm. And uh, while this was taking place during our edit of the episode, our uh, wonderful graphic designer, Ray Dill, and our wonderful editor, Jonathan Choi, uh, they may have mentioned to me uh, that I was wrong, mostly Ray, less so John. Uh, and I said, you know what? Leave it in because I'm curious to see if people are going to correct me. And it took about less than an hour on our Patreon and less than a day on YouTube. So for those of you uh, who uh, know fonts, 
kudos. Thanks for correcting me. Sometimes we do make mistakes. Uh, and sometimes those mistakes are pointed out by my team and I leave them in anyway. So this list of things that I have here, like Ace and Highway, Ghost Hounds, Headstone, Heart Wolf, Hungry Mist, and Mammoth Harness, they're not worth mentioning anymore, so I'm not going to. So there you go. Wonderful. Uh, our misprints, our trivia, all that stuff, it's done. Uh, it's time to take a short break. When we come back, we got to do our best to not have memory lapse when every award. BRB. All right, everybody. It is now time for your favorite part of the show, our favorite part of the show. We could argue everybody's favorite part of the show. It is time for the award show, Homelands Edition. Uh, Patrick, we're going to kick things off with our Oko Thief for Crowns Award for best card in the set. Do you remember what you chose? Memory lapse. You did. Uh, there's an argument for one other card in the set, which I believe is is your nod. This is the one card in the set, I believe, besides, I guess, Tamarian Fiends. That would be uh, catastrophic to put into standard. Can't be reprinted in standard. Was catastrophic when it was put in historic. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not right. okay. Right. Yeah. It's just not an okay card. Uh, and I think you could say the same about Merchant Scroll, uh, which is my selection for best card in the set. It is. And I want to make sure I get this right. Restricted and Vintage. Um, and... They only made one artwork of it, which is kind of a bummer, but it is restricted and vintage because it'd be way too good. It's legal in other formats. It doesn't see playing modern or legacy so much, but uh, yeah, this card is outrageous in older formats. Yeah, super busted. Completely outrageous. So that's Oko Thief Crowns Award. Let's go on to the Carnival of Souls Award for worst card in the set. I'm going first. I select Pharos's Ban because uh, it's not fun. It costs a ton of mana and has no impact on the game, almost certainly. Uh, your selection. Bell Drain of Sinker. Why is that? What's its slogan? The fuck you. Take two. Bang. Bang. That might be on a shirt one day. Who knows? Uh, Yeah, this is uh, really weak, even by the standards of Homelands. It's also a lot of competition in this set among six, seven, eight mana black creatures. Yeah. Like the value of a replacement of this compared to Ishan Shade or Baron, even Baron Sinker, is so low. So in the normal set, it would be, uh, I in most normal sets, it would be a contender. But the fact that this set is saturated with other similar options like that are way better. Big black creatures that are all better. Yeah, just yeah. like a six mana five five, you can't source the plash airs. Like, yeah, pretty That's rough. rough. Uh, Doomblade Award for best non-rare in the set. Your selection. Uh, I assume it's also Memory Lapse. Incorrect. Serrated Arrows? You nailed it. We have Invincible to Serrated Arrows. This card... You know, certainly modest by, you know, today's standards. And even when it got reprinted in Time Spiral as a time shift card, it didn't make much of an impact. But at the time, creatures were a lot smaller and Order of the Ebb in Hand and, and similar creatures were running wild. And this was a really useful artifact for suppressing some of the top threats at the time. Uh, my selection is Memory Lapse. This is not the first time it's going to win an award for me. Card is outrageous. It is a not. A, it is a non-rare, uh, and it's arguably the best card in the set. So it's certainly going to win the Doomblade Award for me. It's time for the Aboro Palace in the Clouds Award for fun of one of in the set. Uh, my selection is Merchant Scroll because uh, it's restricted and vintage. You can only play one of them. You get it. Uh, yours? I'm gonna, maybe I might change my answer. I want to give it to Ishan Shade. Okay. This was another card. First of all, it is a legend, so it definitely is in the fun of one up space. It's expensive. Uh, it was a somewhat useful tournament card at the time um, because there was just a lot of mono white and sorts of plowshares as a removal spell. Um, and this was also a card that alongside your four copies of Serrated Arrows got you up to five to fulfill the home decap requirements home decap is really good like I'm one sorry. copy of Ishan shade is actually maybe a thing you wanted to do anyway yeah sure and the fact that it got you over the line for that restriction was Perfect. relevant maybe that's how we think standard Ishan shade no oh five uh sure i was like you could talk. Yeah, everyone was, has to play the shade i was like you yeah. definitely talked me into it <laughs> but that's a weird starting point <laughs> with with the whole standard doesn't rotate every three years, you have to play five cards from every set. Yeah. That could be cool, maybe. It's too, I think it's too rough on uh, laps players and uh, too constraining for the way that pre cons would have to be built. Okay. All right. See? It yeah. would be nice. At, at a top level, I agree there would be something nice about 
yeah, you got to find something from all the sets. That makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. But I think the uh, costs are not worth the upside. Okay. Even though I think there is like real upside to the to to that system. Uh, it is time for the Mystic Confluence Award for Best Vintage Cube Card in the set. Almost certainly not the Mana Confluence Award. For best vintage cube card in the side. Who would ever say manic influence instead of mystic influence? Uh, you and I, we have the same answer. Do you remember what it is? Merchant scroll. It is merchant scroll. Uh, there are really only two selections: memory lapse and merchant scroll. And merchant scroll is sometimes in the vintage cube. So there you go. Smothering tide award for best commander card in the set. My selection is senior autocrat uh, because I'm tired of saying merchant scroll or memory lapse. And also, um, EDH rec told me that that card sees play. I'm gonna give some love to primal order. Yes, you are. I'm gonna some of these old school cards sets rather. When we talk about the top commander card, I'm going to answer. These were cards I played in my multiplayer games back in the day. Emperor, Star Magic, Chaos Magic. I got deep cuts you've never even heard of. I don't know what So I don't care what's are. on EDH rec. I don't even know what that is. Okay. <laughs> is that just people uploading their commander decks and then like it aggregates data? Yeah, sort of. Get out of here. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, irrelevant to me. Okay. Yeah, Prime Order was sweet multiplayer. It's sweet now. You should consider playing it in your low power decks, probably. I like this stance. Because if you're just here with a if you're just playing with a bunch of veteran players, of course they've all got dual lands. That's what you're complaining about. This helps. Uh Pack Rat Award for best limited card in the set. So my answer is Autumn Willow. Six mana four four, tough to kill. Okay, sure. Could also be Apocalypse Chime if we're making that one legal since it blows up everything. It's a powerful reset button. Do you remember your answer? Giant Oyster. You do remember your answer. It's game okay. over. Yeah. Game over. Good luck with that. Lock them up. Lock them up, kill it, and then repeat. Yeah, for four mana. You see, the set doesn't have much removal, you see. This is a common theme in the sets. You could have, I, I should have given, I think, a little bit more love to Ice Age for at least having removal in it. <laughs> sure. That was a pretty big step in the right direction. Sure. We're back sure. in no removal land. Good luck killing anything. Boy, are we. And this card is really rough if you can't kill it. Uh, Char Rumbler Award for the weirdest card in the set. Do you remember your answer? I'm going to give a dual award to uh, Clockwork Steed and Clockwork Swarm. Good memory. Okay. What is the point of doing both of these? <laughs> They're so... Like I said, one of these would be weird. This this is not quite as bad as Reality Twist, Naked Singularity. Oh, man. But it, we're in weirdly similar and hard to justify even one of these in a set, much less two world. So nice we do it twice. Yeah. Even though we shouldn't have done it at if all. If there was only one in the set, I would probably choose a different card. Okay. Then together, they get the dual wield award. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Marhan, mm -hmm. uh, my favorite big blue creature. Yeah. Uh, I've got a soft spot for the big, big blue, for the big blue bad creature. So, yeah. uh, five UU. So seven mana, eight eight creature serpent doesn't untap during your untap step. Fine. Uh, UU sacrifice a creature, untap Marhan, activate only during your upkeep, and then Marhan can't attack unless defending player controls an island. There's more. Uh, blue blue Marhan gets minus one minus zero so until end of turn and deals one damage to target attacking creature without flying. Uh, there's more. When you control no island, sacrifice Marhan. So, uh, yeah, if you go, if you talk to any player who's been around for a really long time like me, there's a lot of fondness for Mahamodi Jin. There is. And part of that is it's a very sweet, simple design. But also part of it, it was just years and years of blue creatures like this. That just suck. Just like all drawbacks, Armageddon yourself. <laughs> if you Armageddon yourself, this dies. Yeah. Doesn't untap, can't untap. Uh, if it gets blocked, return to your hand. <laughs> just like so much of that stuff. Whereas my money was like, oh, it's like a big body and it as it's, flying. And it's like normal. It doesn't have three different drawbacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just crazy that they would repeatedly print these cards. But I don't know. They were kind of cool, I guess. Uh, blank award for best card name in the set. Hmm. Oh, come on. Okay, well, mine's Apocalypse Chime. Oh, mine is, I'm going to go to Feast of the Universe. There you go. This is a this is the type of naming convention that I'm a sucker for. Is the, there's the punchline on the, at the end, the twist. Yeah. Feast of the Blah could mean like a lot of different celebrations or uh, gatherings or whatever. Feast of the Unicorn. And then the art is a severed head of a unicorn. Pretty intense. Eating good in the neighborhood. Mm hmm uh, John Avon Award for Best Land Artwork in the set. Love me, Wizard School. Uh, I have uh, On Hava Township. And then we... Uh, Gotta say, no bad choices with those five. They're all good. I love the art on all five of those. They're all good. Those cards, even though they're terrible, 
uh, like they're executed well as far as flavor is concerned and artwork. Yeah. So I actually, I'm actually a big fan of those five cards. Uh, we've got the Realist Fury Award for most overhyped card during previous season and the Tarmogoyf Award for uh, most underhyped card during previous season. I wasn't there. I have no answers, uh, but you do. Yeah. So the most overhyped card that I remember was uh, Aether something. Oh, I have a different answer written down for you. Okay. Autumn yeah. Willow. Oh, uh, Autumn Willow, but people actually did end up playing that in some decks. Okay. The uh, Aether, whatever it is that's unplayable. Aether Storm? Yeah. Okay, so this is three into blue. Creature spells can't be cast. Pay for life to destroy this. It can't be regenerated. Any player may activate this. Real tough to get out from underneath. Yeah, so um, first of all, like, why do we the need hell a- kind of card is this? Why do we need a second Pharaoh's ban in the set? Sure. But also, so this is a deck that's ostensibly for supporting your creatureless deck. Yeah. Because you don't care about it. Yep. But then if you're playing with a creatureless deck, your opponent doesn't care about paying four. Yeah, because you have life to work with. This is what's called an inefficient distribution of power. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> Underhype was probably serrated arrows because it seemed innocuous and then ended up being a very surgical role player for that type two standard format. Okay, everybody. We've gotten through all of our awards, which means we have one thing left to do. Any partner, which card won the set? Autumn Willow. Tell me why. It is proof of what could have been. Okay. And it is also uh, sort of reflects the design principles in Homelands that I like a lot. You go through Legends, and you have a lot of Legends that are like reasonably appealing, but a fair number of them are convoluted, bad stats, no powers, whatever. Okay. Uh, the ones in Ice Age, by and large, not really an appealing mix. Okay. This is very simple, but tells a story that's pretty compelling. Okay. And is mechanically unique in a way that's fun and aspirational. That's a bunch of really good stuff here. It's new design space. As you mentioned, it was the first time the Shroud ever got done. Shroud, but I can turn it off sometimes. Awesome. That's so cool. And it's a legend that feels legendary without it being six lines of text. Great design. Uh, for me, it is a creature type dealer. It'll be Baron Seigneur. Not the most powerful of cards, but if we're looking at this set from what did it actually do well, one of those things was the flavor and storyline aspect of things, and Baron Seigneur was a very central figure. One could argue the most central figure uh, amongst all of that stuff. And again, I am not lying when I say this. I actually thought that the storyline aspect of this whole thing was actually really cool. And I know that me reading it to you took a little while and tried to have some fun with that. But I greatly enjoyed that when I was researching it of, again, I don't think I could ever come up with anything like that. So I actually think it's super cool that someone or someone's was just like, yo, let's make a cool story and make cards around it. Uh, and Baron Seigneur, well, he was a dealer. He still he still runs that place today. I have a lot of appreciation for things that look like they were made by people who love magic. Yes. Unfortunately, the people responsible probably should have been working in world building and not initial design. Uh, which leads us very well to our grade of the set. Uh, I'm going to start. Okay. And then I'll let you go. I'm giving uh, Homelands two. The reason I'm not giving it a one, like Chronicles and maybe future sets, is because of the flavor and storyline aspect of the set, which again, I actually think is really cool. Um, everything else about the set is not particularly cool. No mechanics, no cycles, no new stuff. Doesn't really pertain to the Ice Age world whatsoever. Um, and frankly, if I can be honest, it's really embarrassing that the set almost did not get printed and that it is very clear that the East Coast playtesters and development team were just like, nah, we're just not gonna. Look, I'll say this. If they did try, that's embarrassing. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they did not try to fix any of this because they were not particularly on board with the idea of this set and this project. And so they were just messing around. And then it's just like, hey, did you guys read the set? Yeah, it's clear for takeoff, boss. Okay, cool. And then it comes out and it's a disaster because if they did try, oh my God. Mm -hmm. It's a really bad set. But the flavor and stuff is actually really cool. And the artwork's good. I think so too. Yeah, I think that's good, but it's really hard to give it above a two. So that's my grade. I'm going to give Homelands a three. Ooh, okay. There is a handful of really good stuff going on in here that you could actually draw from and apply it 
and has been applied uh, in sets that are very good. Um, the world building in general, I think, is great, but also pulling from Magic's past, just a handful of names and characters, and using that as the foundation for the story makes the world feel richer. It's not just about this set. It adds to the sets that came before it. Totally, way, which totally is a, agree. An awesome thing. Yep. I love making the thing bigger. Yep. And again, that's something that Magic continues to do nowadays with names that appeared for the first time in Alpha still show up in future sets and are still parts of the world building. Yep. Another design element that I really appreciate about this set is there are legends that are simple and definitely feel legendary. It is a very common design fallacy to say, well, this card's a rare or this card's a legend. It needs to do all this stuff. It has to have all these powers to feel legendary. And that's true some of the time, but that does not have to be true all the time. And okay. Ishan Shade, Autumn Willow, Baron Sengur, definitely an Air on the Relentless, there's no trouble buying any of these cards as legends. Now, there are some stinkers in there as well. There are. Which, and, and some of the legends don't feel like legends at all and don't really make very much sense. But there are a handful of designs in here that I that are refreshingly simple, straightforward, and appealing uh, in Magic's sort of early attempts at designing legendary creatures. Okay. Unfortunately, the set has nothing new going on and it's extremely bad. Power level wise. Yes. And all those things are multiplied by the fact that this was also true of several sets that came before it. Okay. My feeling on the issue is that if you just reverse the order, if you turn homelands into the dark and the dark into homelands, that the dark is the set that is remembered as being historically weak. Oh, okay. okay. The reason for this is that it's just the downward momentum of magic at the time. I do not think that Homelands is uniquely bad from a power level perspective compared to some of these sets, but the fact that it's just more of the same, more of like, like when are we going to get a, a card that's fun to play with and powerful? Sure. Why is the game still defined by all the cards that came out in the first set? That feeling I was there for it um, was really, really noticeable. And it was, I started to feel like the, is a set ever going to come out again that I care about? I could feel that. A lot of my friends could feel that too. But I don't put that exclusively on the feet of Homelands. Okay. Homelands certainly has some blame for it, but it is also sort of the debt accrued by Chronicles, Ice Age, Fallen Empires, uh, arguably the Dark. Okay, okay. Yeah, I guess that actually makes, once the snowball's rolling downhill, People are going to have a more critical eye on a bad set and just go like, okay, yes. this one's horrible too. And But like maybe be hyperbolic about it and like, okay, this is the worst set of all time. Right. Like let's, uh, let's compare it to the dark. Okay. All right. Most powerful cards in the sets. Let's say it's Merchant Scroll Memory Lapse versus Blood Moon Maze of Eth. I think that's reasonable. Okay. It's not clear to me that Memory Lapse and Merchant Scroll is clearly weaker as a pair than those two. Okay, sure. The sure. rank and file creatures are like about as bad. I mean, Ishan Shade's better than any big creature in the dark. The dark, yeah. Most so of the dark. I, don't, I don't even know if the dark has a good big creature. No, I, I, I don't even know if it has any big creatures. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's uh, the dark has very little in the way of removal. Yep. Mine's also very little in the way of removal. You know, I I haven't actually done a full count, so I don't know for sure. But people don't talk about the dark the same way they talk about homeland. That's definitely true. Even though. I'm sure if you wrote it, it would be pretty close at the end of the day, which set was actually stronger, which set was weaker. And a lot of the stigma of Homelands, in my opinion, is just the the line just keeps going down. And uh, fortunately, Magic shook it off sets that are coming up and Magic really needed it because um, we were pretty close to kind of a, a, a death cycle that was hard to get out of. Well, the good news is because we're recording this and we still talk about magic, uh, magic got through this death cycle and it started with the next set. Certified banger. Alliances. One of the all time greats. Uh, after doing basically five bad sets in a row. Uh, and I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Homelands was the newest set for, I believe eight months. 
Full. Yeah. I, Did you know that? I Now that you mention it, I, I vaguely recall it taking a while. I didn't remember eight months, but I remember it being a bit. I believe that's in my notes for Alliances is that this set came out eight months after Homelands did, which means that's a really long time for Homelands to be the new thing to buy in combination with. I can only imagine to be a game store owner at this time, but it's like, what do you guys got on the shelves for Magic? We got Homelands, we got Fallen Empires. We can't get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And they're just on there. It's like, when's the next set to come out? Great question. We'd like to know, too. <laughs> and we don't know. Uh, so you're going to have to make do. And eight months might not seem like a long time. I mean, it's a. Think about it, how it does you, for the way that Magic gets released now. Could you imagine the product not coming out for eight months? That's what I was going to say. Could you imagine product not coming out for eight weeks? No. Yeah. No, I cannot. So, uh, alliances did a lot to get that snowball to stop rolling downhill, and that's going to be our next episode here on the Resleepables. We get to talk about what Force of Will, and a bunch of other cards that are in here. Right? Oh, I mean, we're talking about cycles. I'm just what are like the really good cards in here? Like Force of Will is the first card I ever think of when I think of alliances. I, do you mean like secondary market? Are we kind of talking just like sure. I mean whatever. Like just, of the dead, that card is really good. Yeah, that card is pretty cool. Uh, I mean at the time it's probably not very good anymore. Look, Jeldor and Outpost was a huge deal. Yeah, that card was a banger. That's yeah. right. Okay, I forgot um, that was in this set. Yeah, there's a. Uh, uh contagion i know that card the, was good uh, pyrokinesis that card was good i played there's, that card in legacy there's cycles and it, it's in my vintage deck i have a pyrokinesis in the sideboard of my vintage deck okay yeah okay. it's a it's a set with a lot of really cool cycles and the cycles are strong nice and there's other cool stuff going on uh there too and i remember it was like the first time i won a specific card as a prize at my lgs okay okay so a lot of fond memories. This is also the first pack opening that we're going to do where there could be a card in the pack worth more than the cost of the pack. That's true. <laughs> it's been and a that's, while. <laughs> that's pretty exciting as well for those of you who are patrons who can win that sort of thing. Speaking of which, uh, we got to do our little advertising on our way out the door. First of all, uh, we want to thank you guys for watching this episode of The Receivables. If you are not subscribed to the YouTube page, you can like subscribe share all that jazz as we make our way up to 10,000 subscribers here on our youtube page you can also follow us on twitter at twitter.com slash the receivables where we do post uh when new episodes go live we also do post about the unsleeved podcast as well which you can find over on our patreon page at patreon.com slash the receivables where you can get episodes of the receivables early you can also of course get access to our unsleeved podcast which is a patreon exclusive podcast that we do at least three times a month in which we i don't know we rant and rave about what's going on in our lives and also take on readers questions of uh, which is truthfully a lot of fun as our uh, our readers our loyal jackal pups as we uh so affectionately call them send in uh some really fun things for us to answer so alliances on tap next we of course want to thank our sponsor tales of adventure for being awesome and partner force of will coming at us soon hopefully lake of the dead's a banger too it's worth yeah. a lot we this is the first set that we've done a pack opening for since we opened a pack of italian legends where there could be a hit uh fingers crossed if someone will open something nice in our crack a pack winners thanks for watching